Popol Vuh and the Mayan Universe, translated into English by Temple Monroe, Wells Barnabas, and Courtney Maria Dawson, original copyright, 1962. Introduction This is the beginning of the old traditions of this place called Quiche. Here we shall write, and we shall begin the old stories, the beginning and the origin of all that was done in the town of Quiche by the tribes of the Quiche nation, and here we shall set forth the revelation, the declaration, and the narration of all that was hidden, the revelation by Tzakol, Bitol, Alom, and Kaholom, who are Hunapu Vush, Hunapu Utiu, and Zakinimatsis, as they were named, at the same time the declaration, the combined narration of the grandmother and the grandfather, whose names are Ixpiakok and Ixmukane, helpers and protectors, twice grandmother, twice grandfather, so named in the Quiche Chronicles. Then we shall tell all that they did in the light of existence, in the light of history. This we shall write now under the law of God and Christianity, we shall bring it to light, because now the Popol Vuh, as it is named, cannot be seen any more, in which was dearly seen the coming from the other side of the sea, and the narration of our obscurity, and our life was clearly seen. The original book, written long ago, existed, but its sight is hidden to the searcher and to the thinker. Greet were the descriptions and the account of how all the sky and earth were formed, how it was formed and divided into four parts, how it was partitioned and how the sky was divided, and the measuring cord was brought and it was stretched in the sky and over the earth, on the four angles, on the four corners, as was told by the Creator and the Maker, the Mother and the Father of life, of all created things. He who gives breath and thought, she who gives birth to the children, he who watches over the happiness of the people, the happiness of the human race, the wise man, he who meditates on the goodness of all that exists in the sky, on the earth in the lakes, and in the sea. Part 1 This is the account of how all was in suspense, all calm, in silence, all motionless, still, and the expanse of the sky was empty. This is the first account, the first narrative. There was neither man nor animal, birds, fish, crabs, trees, stones, caves, ravines, grasses, nor forests. There was only the sky. The surface of the earth had not appeared. There was only the calm sea and the great expanse of the sky. There was nothing brought together, nothing that could make a noise, nor anything that might move, tremble, or make noise in the sky. Nothing was standing, only the calm water, the placid sea, alone and tranquil. Nothing existed. There was only immobility and silence in the darkness of the night. In the light-filled water, there were only the Creator, the Maker, Tepu, Guchumats, and the Forefathers. They were hidden under green and blue feathers, and were therefore called Gukumats. By nature, they were great sages and great thinkers. In this manner, the sky existed, as did the heart of heaven, which is the name of G-God, and thus he is called. Then came the word. Tepu and Guchumats came together in the darkness, and they talked. They talked then, discussing and deliberating. They agreed, and they united their words and their thoughts. Then while they meditated, it became clear to them that when dawn would break, man must appear. Then they planned the creation and growth of the trees and the thickets, the birth of life, and the creation of man. As a result, the heart of heaven, also known as Hurakan, set it up in the night and in the darkness. The first is called Kakulha Hurakan, the second is Chipi Kakulha, the third is Raksa Kakulha, and these three are the hearts of heaven. Then Tepu and Guchumats came together. Then they conferred about life and light and what they would do so that there would be light and dawn, which would be who would provide food and sustenance. Thus let it be done. Let the emptiness be filled. 
Let the water recede and make a void. Let the earth appear and become solid. Let it be done. Thus they spoke. Let there be light. Let there be dawn in the sky and on the earth. There shall be neither glory nor grandeur in our creation and formation until the human being is made. Man is formed. So they spoke. And then they created the earth. So it was in truth that they created the earth. Earth! They said, and instantly it was made, like the mist, like a cloud, and like a cloud of dust was the creation when the mountains appeared from the water, and instantly the mountains grew. Only by a miracle, only by magic art, were the mountains and valleys formed, and instantly the groves of cypresses and pines put forth shoots together on the surface of the earth. And thus Guchumatz was filled with joy, and exclaimed, Your coming has been fruitful, heart of heaven, and you, Hurakan, and you, Chipikakulha, Raksa Kakulha. Our work, our creation shall be finished, they answered. First the earth was formed, the mountains and the valleys, the currents of water were divided, the rivulets were running freely between the hills, and the water was separated when the high mountains appeared. Thus was the earth created when it was formed by the heart of heaven, the heart of earth, as they are called, who first made it fruitful when the sky was in suspense and the earth was submerged in the water. So it was that they perfected the work when they did it after thinking and meditating on it. Then they made the small wild animals, the guardians of the woods, the spirits of the mountains, the deer, the birds, pumas, jaguars, serpents and snakes vipers, guardians of the thickets. And the forefathers asked, Shall there be only silence and calm under the trees, under the vines? It is well that hereafter there be someone to guard them. So they said this when they meditated and talked. Promptly the deer and the birds were created. Immediately they gave homes to the deer and the birds. You, dear, shall sleep in the fields by the river bank and in the ravines. Here you shall be amongst the thicket, amongst the pasture. In the woods you shall multiply, you shall walk on four feet, and they will support you. Thus be it done. So it was they who spoke. Then they also assigned homes to the birds, big and small. You shall live in the trees and in the vines. There you shall make your nests. There you shall multiply. There you shall increase in the branches of the trees and in the vines. Thus the deer and the birds were told that they did their duty at once, and all sought their homes and their nests. And the creation of all the four-footed animals and the birds being finished, they were told by the Creator, the Maker, and the forefathers. Speak, cry, warble, call, speak, each one according to your variety, each according to your kind. So was it said to the deer, the birds, pumas, jaguars, and serpents, Speak then our names, praise us your mother, your father. Invoke then Hurakan, Chipikakulha, Raksa Kakulha, the heart of heaven, the heart of earth, the creator, the maker, the forefathers. Speak, invoke us, adore us, they were told. But they could not make them speak like men. They only hissed and screamed and cackled. They were unable to make words, and each screamed differently. When the Creator and the Maker saw that they couldn't talk to each other, they said, It is impossible for them to say our names, the names of us, their Creators and Makers. This is not well, said the forefathers to each other. Then they said to them, Because it has not been possible for you to talk, you shall be changed. We have changed our minds, your food, your pasture, and your homes, and your nests you shall have. They shall be the ravines and the woods, because it has not been possible for you to adore us or invoke us. There shall be those who adore us, and we shall make other beings who shall be obedient. Accept your destiny, your flesh shall be torn to pieces. So shall it be. This shall be your lot. So they said, when they made known their will to the large and small animals that are on the face of the earth, they wished to give them another trial, they wished to make another attempt, they wished to make all living things adore them. But they could not understand each other's speech, they could succeed in nothing and could do nothing. 
For this reason they were sacrificed, and the animals that were on earth were condemned to be killed and eaten. For this reason another attempt had to be made to create and make men by the Creator, the Maker, and the Forefathers. Let us try again. Already dawn draws near. Let us make Him who shall nourish and sustain us. What shall we do to be invoked in order to be remembered on earth? We have already tried with our first creations, our first creatures, but we could not make them praise and venerate us. So then, let us try to make obedient, respectful beings who will nourish and sustain us. Thus they spoke. Then came the creation and the formation. Of earth and of mud they made man's flesh. But they saw that it was not good. It melted away. It was soft, did not move, and had no strength. It fell down. It was limp. It could not move its head. Its face fell to one side. Its sight was blurred, and it could not look behind. At first it spoke, but had no mind. Quickly it soaked up the water and could not stand. And the Creator and the Maker said, Let us try again, because our creatures will not be able to walk or multiply. Let us consider this, they said. Then they broke up and destroyed their work and their creation. And they said, What shall we do to perfect it in order that our worshippers, our invokers, will be successful? Thus they spoke when they conferred again. Let us say again to Expiacoc, Exmukane, Hunah Puvuk, and Hunah Uti, Cast your lot again, try to create again. In this manner, the Creator and the Maker spoke to Expiacoc and Exmukane. Then they spoke to those soothsayers, the grandmother of the day, the grandmother of the dawn, as they were called by the Creator and the Maker, and whose names were Expiacoc and Exmukane, and said Hurakan, Tepeu, and Guchumats when they spoke to the soothsayer, to the Maker, who are the diviners. You must work together and find the means so that man whom we shall make, man whom we are going to make, will nourish and sustain us, invoke and remember us. Enter then into council, Grandmother, Grandfather, Our Grandmother, Our Grandfather, Xpiakok, Xmukane, Make Light, Make Dawn. Have we been invoked? Have we been adored? Have we been remembered by created man, by made man, by mortal man? Thus be it done. Let your nature be known, Hunapuvuch, Hunapuutiu, twice mother, twice father, Nimak, Nimatsiz, the master of emeralds, the worker in jewels, the sculptor, the carver, the maker of beautiful plates, the maker of green gourds, the master of resin, the master Toltecat, grandmother of the sun, grandmother of dawn, as you will be called by our works and our creatures. Cast the lot with your grains of corn and tsite. Do it thus, and we shall know if we are to make or carve his mouth and eyes out of wood. Thus, the diviners were told, they went down at once to make their divination and cast their lots with the corn and the tsite. Fate, creature, said an old woman and an old man, and this older man was the one who cast the lots with tsite, the one called Ixpiakok, and the older woman was the diviner, the maker, called Chirakan Ksmukane. Beginning the divination, they said, Get together, grasp each other, speak, that we may hear. They said, Say if it is well that the wood be put together, and that it be carved by the Creator and the Maker. And if this man of wood is he who must nourish and sustain us when there is light, when it is day. Thou corn, thou tsite, thou fate, thou creature, get together, take each other, they said to the corn, to the tsite, to fate, and to the creature. Come to sacrifice here, heart of heaven, do not punish Tepo and Gukumats. Then they talked and spoke the truth. Your figures of wood shall come out well, they shall speak and talk on earth. So may it be, they answered when they spoke, and instantly the figures were made of wood. They looked like men, talked like men, and populated the surface of the earth. They existed and multiplied, they had daughters, sons, and these wooden figures, but they did not have souls nor minds. They did not remember their creator, their maker. They walked on all fours, aimlessly. 
They no longer remembered the heart of heaven, and therefore they fell out of favor. It was merely a trial, an attempt at man. At first they spoke, but their faces were without expression. Their feet and hands had no strength. They had no blood, substance, moisture, or flesh. Their cheeks were dry, their feet and hands were dry, and their flesh was yellow. Therefore they no longer thought of their Creator, nor of their Maker, nor of those who made them and cared for them. These were the first men who existed in great numbers on the face of the earth. Immediately the wooden figures were annihilated, destroyed, broken up, and killed. The heart of heaven caused a flood which resulted in a massive flood that fell on the heads of the wooden creatures. The Creator and Maker created the flesh of man out of tsite, but when they created the flesh of a woman, they used rushes. These were the materials the Creator and the Maker wanted to use in making them. But those that they had made, that they had created, did not think or speak with their Creator, and for this reason they were killed and they were deluged. A heavy resin fell from the sky. The one called Sekotkovash came and gouged out their eyes. Camelots came and cut off their heads, and Kotzbalam came and devoured their flesh. Tukumbalam came too, and broke and mangled their bones and their nerves, and ground and crumbled their bones. This was to punish them, because they had not thought of their mother, nor their father, the heart of heaven, called Hurakan. For this reason the face of the earth was darkened, and a black rain began to fall by day and by night. Then came the small animals and the large animals, and sticks and stones struck their faces. And all began to speak, their earthen jars, their griddles, their plates, their pots, and their grinding stones all rose up and struck their faces. You have done us much harm, you ate us, and now we shall kill you, said their dogs and birds of the barnyard. And the grinding stones cried out, You tormented us. Every day, every day, at night, at dawn, all the time our faces went, Holy, holy, hooky, hooky, because of you. This was the tribute we paid you. But now that you are no longer men, you will feel our strength. We shall grind and tear your flesh to pieces, said their grinding stones. And then their dogs spoke and said, Why did you give us nothing to eat? You scarcely looked at us, but you chased us and threw us out. You always had a stick ready to strike us while you were eating. Thus it was that you treated us. You did not speak to us. Perhaps we shall not kill you now, but why did you not look ahead? Why did you not think about yourselves? Now we shall destroy you. Now you shall feel the teeth of our mouths. We shall devour you, said the dogs, and then they destroyed their faces. And at the same time their griddles and pots spoke. Pain and suffering you have caused us. Our mouths and our faces were blackened with soot. We were always put on the fire, and you burned us as though we felt no pain. Now you shall feel it, we shall burn you, said their pots, and they all destroyed their wooden men's faces. The stones of the hearth, which were heaped together, hurled themselves straight from the fire against their heads, causing them pain. The desperate ones, the men of wood, ran as quickly as they could. They wanted to climb to the tops of the houses and the houses fell down and threw them to the ground. They wanted to climb to the treetops, and the trees cast them far away. They wanted to enter the caverns, and the caverns repelled them. So was the ruin of the men who had been created and formed, the men made to be destroyed and annihilated. The mouths and faces of all of them were mangled and it is said that their descendants are the monkeys which now live in the forests. These are all that remain of them, because their flesh was made only of wood by the Creator and the Maker. Therefore the monkey looks like a man, and is an example of a generation of men who were created and made, but were only wooden figures. The earth was cloudy and twilight at the time. There was no sun yet. Nevertheless, there was a being called Vukub Kakix, who was very proud of himself. The sky and the earth existed, but the faces of the sun and the moon were covered. And he, Vukub Kakix, said, Truly, 
They are clear examples of those people who were drawned, and their nature is that of supernatural beings. I shall now be great above all the beings created and formed. I am the sun, the light, the moon, he exclaimed. Great is my splendor. Because of me, men shall walk and conquer. For my eyes are of silver, bright, resplendent as precious stones as emeralds. My teeth shine like perfect stones, like the face of the sky. My nose shines afar like the moon. My throne is of silver, and the face of the earth is lighted when I pass before my throne. So then I am the sun, I am the moon for all mankind. So shall it be, because I can see very far. So Vukub Kakik spoke. But he was not really the sun. He was only vainglorious of his feathers and his riches. And he could see only as far as the horizon, and he could not see over all the world. The face of the sun had not yet appeared, nor that of the moon, nor the stars, and it had not dawned. Therefore, Vukub Kakix became as vain as though he were the sun and the moon, because the light of the sun and the moon had not yet shown itself. His only ambition was to exalt himself and to dominate. And all this happened when the flood came because of the wooden people. Now we shall tell how Vukub Kakix was overthrown and died, and how man was made by the Creator and the Maker. Two young people, the first of whom went by the name Hunap, and the second by the name Ixbalanke, started the defeat and destruction of the glory of Vukub Kakix at this point. They were really gods. When they saw the harm that the arrogant one had done and wished to do in the presence of the heart of heaven, the youth said, It is not good that it be so when a man does not yet live here on earth. Therefore, we shall try to shoot him with our blowgun when he is eating. We shall shoot him and make him sicken, and then that will be the end of his riches, his green stones, his precious metals, his emeralds, his jewels, of which he is so proud. And this shall be the lot of all men, for they must not become vain because of power and riches. Thus shall it be, said the youths, each one putting his blowgun to his shoulder. Well, now Vukub Kakix had two sons. The first was called Zipakna, and the second was Kabrakan. The mother of the two was called Shimalmat, the wife of Vukub Kakix. Well, Zipakna played ball with the large mountains, with Chigag, Hunapu, Pakul, Yakskanul, Makamob, and Huliznab. These are the names of the mountains which existed when it dawned and which were created in a single night by Zipakna. In this way, Kabrakan moved the mountains and made the large and small mountains tremble. In this way, the sons of Vukub Kakix proclaimed their pride. Listen, I am the sun, said Vukub Kakix. I am he who made the earth, said Zipakna. I am he who shook the sky and made the earth tremble, said Kabrakan. In this way, the sons of Vukub Kekex followed the example of their father's assumed greatness. And this didn't seem very good to the youths. Neither our first mother nor our first father had yet been created. Therefore, the youths decided on Vukub Kakex and his son's demise and destruction. Now we shall tell how the two youths shot their blowguns at Vukub Kakex, and how each one of those who had become arrogant was destroyed. Vukub Kakix had a large Yangtze tree, and he ate the fruit of it. Each day he went to the tree and climbed to the top. Hunapu and Xbalanke had seen that this fruit was his food, and they lay in ambush at the foot of the tree, hidden among the leaves. Vukub Kakix came straight to his meal of Nant. Instantly he was injured by a discharge from Hunhunapu's blowgun, which struck him squarely in the jaw, and screaming, he fell straight to earth from the treetop. Hunhunapu ran quickly to overpower him, but Vukub Kakik seized his arm and, wrenching it from him, bent it back to the shoulder. In this way, Vukub Kakix tore out Hunhunap's arm. Without a doubt, the two young people did well to resist letting Vukub Kakix defeat them first. 
Carrying Hun Hunapu's arm, Vukub Kakrix went home and arrived there, nursing his jaw. What has happened to you, my lord? said Chimalmat, his wife. What could it be but those two demons who shot me with blowguns and dislocated my jaw? For that reason, my teeth are loose and pain me very much. But I have brought it his arm to put it on the fire. Let it hang there over the fire, for surely these demons will come looking for it. So said Vukub Kakix as he hung up the arm of Hun Hunapu. Having thought it over, Hun Hunapu and Ixbalanke went to talk with an older man who had snow-white hair, and with an older woman, really very old and humble, both already bent, like very older adults. The older man was called Zaki Nim Ak, and the older woman, Zaki Nima Tsis. The youth said to the older woman and the older man, Come with us to Vukub Kakix's house to get our arm. We will follow you, and you shall tell them, These with us are our grandchildren. Their mother and father are dead, so they follow us everywhere we are given arms, for the only thing that we know how to do is take the worm from the teeth. So Vukub Kakix shall think we are boys, and we shall also be there to advise you, said the two youths. Very well answered the old man and woman. Then they started out for the place where they found Vukub Kakix reclining on his throne. The two boys walked behind the older man and woman as they moved along. In this way, they arrived at the house of the Lord, who was screaming because his tooth hurt him. When Vukub Kakix saw the old man and the old woman and those who accompanied them, he asked, Where do you come from, grandparents? We come looking for something to eat, honourable sir, they answered. And what do you eat? Are those not your sons who are with you? Oh no, sir, they are our grandsons, but we are sorry for them, and what is given to us we share with them, sir, answered the old woman and the old man. Meanwhile the Lord was suffering terrible pain from his tooth, and it was only with great difficulty that he could speak. I earnestly beseech you to have pity on me. What can you do? What do you know how to cure? The Lord asked them, and the old ones answered, O oh, sir, we only take the worm from the teeth, cure the eyes, and set bones. Very well, cure my teeth, which are really making me suffer day and night, and because of them and of my eyes I cannot be calm and cannot sleep. All of this is because two demons shot me with a pellet from their blowgun, and for that reason I cannot eat. Have pity on me then, tighten my teeth with your hands. Very well, sir. It is a worm which makes you suffer. It will end when these teeth are pulled and others put in their place. It is not well that you pull my teeth, because it is only with them that I am a lord and all my ornaments are my teeth and my eyes. We will put others of ground bone in their place. But the ground bone was nothing but grains of white corn. Very well, pull them out, come and relieve me, he replied. Then they pulled Vukub Kakix's teeth, but in their place they put only grains of white corn, and these grains of corn shone in his mouth. Instantly his features sagged, and he no longer looked like a lord. They removed the rest of his teeth, which shone like pearls in his mouth, and finally they cured Vukub Kakix's eyes, piercing the pupils of his eyes, and they took all his riches. But he felt nothing any more. He only watched because, at the advice of Hunapu and Exbalanke, they took from him all of the things of which he had been so proud. Then Vukub Kakix died, Hun Hunapu recovered his arm, Chimalmat, the wife of Vukub Kakix, also perished. In this way, Vukub Kakix lost his riches. The healer took all the emeralds and precious stones which had been his pride here on earth. The older woman and the older man who did this were miraculous beings, and having recovered the arm of Hun Hunapu, they put it in place, and it was all right again. It was only to bring about the death of Vukub Kakix that they did this because it seemed wicked to them that he should become so arrogant. And then the two youths went on, having in this way carried out the order of the heart of heaven. Here now are the deeds of Zipakna, the elder son of Vukub Kakix. I am the creator of the mountains, said Zipakna. 
Zipakna was bathing at the edge of a river when four hundred youths passed, dragging a log to support their house. The four hundred were walking after having cut down a large tree to make the ridge pole of their house. Then Zipachna came up, and going toward the four hundred youths, said to them, What are you doing, boys? It is only this log, they answered, which we cannot lift and carry on our shoulders. I will carry it. Where does it have to go? What do you want it for? For a ridge pole for our house. All right, he answered, and lifting it up, he put it on his shoulders and carried it to the entrance of the house of the four hundred boys. Now stay with us, boy, they said. Have you a mother or father? I have neither, he answered. Then we shall hire you tomorrow to prepare another log to support our house. Good, he answered. The four hundred boys talked together then and said, How shall we kill this boy? Because what he has done lifting the log alone is not good. Let us make a big hole and push him so that he will fall into it. Go down and take out the earth and carry it from the pit, we shall tell him, and when he stoops down to go down into the pit, we shall let the large log fall on him, and he will die there in the pit. So said the four hundred boys, and then they dug a large, very deep pit. Then they called Zipaxna. We like you very much. Go, go and dig dirt, for we cannot reach the bottom of the pit, they said. All right, he answered. He went at once into the pit, and calling to him as he was digging the dirt, they said, Have you gone down very deep yet? Yes, he answered, beginning to dig the pit, but the pit which he was making was to save him from danger. He knew that they wanted to kill him, so when he dug the pit, he made a second hole at one side in order to free himself. How far have you gone? The four hundred boys called down. I am still digging, I will call up to you when I have finished the digging said Zipagnar from the bottom of the pit. But he was not digging his grave. Instead, he was opening another pit in order to save himself. At last, Zipakna called to them, but when he called, he was already safe in the second pit. Come and take out and carry away the dirt which I have dug and which is in the bottom of the pit, he said, because in truth I have made it very deep. Do you hear my call? Nevertheless, your calls, your words, repeat themselves like an echo, once, twice, and so I hear well where you are. So Zipakna called from the pit where he was hidden, shouting from the depths. Then the boys hurled the great log violently, and it fell quickly with a thud to the bottom of the pit. Let no one speak, let us wait until we hear his dying screams, they said to each other, whispering and each one covered his face as the log fell noisily. Izipakna spoke then, crying out, but he called only once when the log fell to the bottom. How well we have succeeded in this, now he is dead, said the boys. If, unfortunately, he had continued what he had begun to do, we would have been lost, because he already had interfered with us, the four hundred boys. And filled with joy, they said, Now we must make our chicha within the next three days. When the three days are past, we shall drink to the construction of our new house, we, the four hundred boys. Then they said, Tomorrow we shall look, and the day after tomorrow we shall also look to see if the ants do not come out of the earth when the body smells and begins to rot. Presently we shall become calm and drink our chicha, they said. But from his pit, Zipakna listened to everything the boys said. And later, on the second day, multitudes of ants came going and coming and gathering under the log. Some carried Zipakna's hair in their mouths, and others carried his fingernails. When the boys saw this, they said, That devil has now perished. Look how the ants have gathered, how they have come by hordes, some bringing his hair and others his fingernails. Look what we have done! So they spoke to each other. Nevertheless, Zipakna was very much alive. He had cut his hair and gnawed off his fingernails to give them to the ants. And so the four hundred boys believed that he was dead, and on the third day they began the orgy, and all of the boys got drunk. And the four hundred being drunk knew nothing any more. 
and then Zipakna let the house fall on their heads and killed all of them. Not even one or two among the four hundred were saved. They were killed by Zipakna, son of Vukub Kakix. In this way, the four hundred boys died, and it is said that they became the group of stars which because of them are called Mots, but it may not be true. We will now describe how Hunap and Exbalanke, the two boys, defeated Zipakna. Now comes Zipakna's defeat and death as a result of the two boys, Hunap and Exbalanke, overwhelming him. The boys' hearts were full of rancor because the four hundred young men had been killed by Zipakna. He only hunted fish and crabs at the bank of the river, which were his daily food. During the day he went about looking for food, and at night he carried mountains on his back. With a leaf of the esi plant which is found in the forest, Hunapu and Xbalonke quickly made a figure to look like a very large crab. With this they made the stomach of the crab, the claws they made of pahak, and for the shell which covers the back they used a stone. Then they put the crab at the bottom of a cave at the foot of a large mountain called Meaguan, where he was overcome. Then the boys went to find Zipakna on the river bank. Where are you going, young man? they asked him. I am not going anywhere, Zipakna answered. Only looking for food, boys. And what is your food? Fish and crabs, but there are none here, and I have not found any. I have not eaten since the day before yesterday, and I am dying of hunger, said Zipakna to Hunapu and Exbalanke. Over there in the bottom of the ravine there is a crab, a really large crab, and it would be well if you would eat it, only it bit us when we tried to catch it, and so we were afraid. We wouldn't try to catch it for anything, said Hunapu and Exbalanke. Have pity on me, come and show it to me, boys, begged Zipakna. We do not want to. You go alone, you will not get lost. Follow the bank of the river, and you will come out at the foot of a large hill. There it is making a noise at the bottom of the ravine. You have only to go there, said Hunapu and Exbalanke. Oh, unfortunate me! Won't you accompany me, boys? Come and show it to me. There are many birds which you can shoot with your blowguns, and I know where to find them said Zipakna. His meekness convinced the boys, and they asked him, But can you really catch him? Because it is only for you that we are returning. We are not going to try to get it again, because it bit us when we were crawling into the cave. After that we were afraid to crawl in, but we almost caught it. So, then, it is best that you crawl in, they said. Very well, said Zipakna, and then they went with him. They arrived at the bottom of the ravine, and there, stretched on his back, was the crab, showing his red shell. And there, also in the bottom of the ravine, was the boy's hoax. Good, good, said Zipakna happily. I should like to have it in my mouth already and he was really dying of hunger. He wanted to try to crawl in, he wanted to enter, but the crab was climbing. He came out at once, and the boys asked, Did you not get it? No, he answered, because he was going up and I almost caught him. But perhaps it would be good if I go in from above, he added. And then he entered again from above. But as he was almost inside, with only the soles of his feet showing, the great hill slid and fell slowly down on his chest. Zipakna never returned, and he was changed into stone. The two boys, Hunap and Exbalanke, defeated Zipaknar in this way. He was the elder son of Vukub Kakex, and according to the legend, he was the one who made the. At the foot of the hill called Meaguan, he was vanquished. Only by a miracle was he vanquished, the second of the arrogant ones. One was left whose history we shall tell now. The third of the arrogant ones was the second son of Vukub Kakix, who was called Kabrakan. I demolish the mountains, he said, but Hunapu and Exbalanke also defeated Kabrakan. Hurakan, Chipi Kakulha, and Raksa Kakulha talked and said to Hunapu and Exbalanke, Let the second son of Vukub Kakix also be defeated. This is our will. 
for it is not well what they do on earth, exalting their glory, their grandeur, and their power, and it must not be so. Lure him to where the sun rises, said Hurakan to the two youths. Very well, honored sir, they answered, because what we see is not right. Do you not exist, you who are the peace, you, heart of heaven, said the boys as they listened to the command of Hurakan. Meanwhile, Kabra Khan was busy shaking the mountains. At the gentlest tap of his feet on the earth, the large and small mountains opened. Thus, the boys found him and asked Kabra Khan, Where are you going, young man? Nowhere, he answered. Here I am moving the mountains, and I am leveling them to the ground forever, he answered. Then Kabra Khan asked Hunapu and Ixbalanke, What did you come to do here? I do not recognize you. What are your names? said Kabra Khan. We have no names, they answered. We are nothing more than shooters of blowguns and hunters with bird traps in the mountains. We are poor, and we have nothing, young man. We only walk over the large and small mountains, young man. And we have just seen a large mountain over there where you see the pink sky. It really rises up very high and overlooks the tops of all the hills. So it is that we have not been able to catch even one or two of the birds on it, boy. But is it true that you can level all the mountains? Hunapu and Exbalanke asked Kabra Khan. Have you really seen the mountain of which you speak? Where is it? If I see it, I shall demolish it. Where did you see it? Over there it is, where the sun rises, said Hunapu and Exbalanke. Very well, show me the road, he said to the two boys. Oh, no! they answered, we must take you between us. One shall go to your left and the other to your right, because we have our blowguns, and if there should be birds, we can shoot them. And so they set out happily, trying out their blowguns. But when they shot with them, they did not use the clay pellets in the tube of the blowgun. Instead, they felled the birds only with a puff of air when they shot them, which surprised Kabra Khan very much. Then the boys built a fire and put the birds on it to roast, but they rubbed one of the birds with chalk, covering it with white earth soil. We shall give him this, they said, to wet his appetite with the odor which it gives off. This bird of ours shall be his ruin as we cover this bird with earth, so we shall bring him down to the earth and bury him in the earth. Great shall be the wisdom of a created being, of a being fashioned, when it dawns, when there is light, said the boys. As it is natural for man to wish to eat, so Kabra Khan desires food, said Hunapu and Shizbalanke to each other. Meanwhile, the birds were roasting. They were beginning to turn golden brown, and the fat and juice which dripped from them made an appetizing odor. Kabra Khan wanted very much to eat them, they made his mouth water, he yawned, and the saliva and spittle drooled because of the smell that the birds gave off. Then he asked them, What is that you eat? The smell is really savory. Give me a little piece, he said to them. Then they gave a bird to Kabra Khan, the one which would be his ruin, and when he had finished eating it, they set out toward the east, where the great mountain was, but already Kabra Khan's legs and hands were weakening, and he had no strength because of the earth with which the bird he had eaten was rubbed, and he could do nothing to the mountains. Neither was it possible to level them. Then the boys tied him, they tied his hands behind him, and also tied his neck and his feet together. Then they threw him to the ground, and there they buried him. Hunap and Exbalanke successfully overcame Kabra Khan in this way. It would be impossible to tell of all the things they did here on earth. Now we shall tell of the birth of Hunapu and Exbalanke, having first told of the destruction of Vukub Kakix and that of Zipakna and of Kabra Khan here on earth. Part 2 Now we shall also tell the name of the father of Hunapu and Exbalanke. We shall not tell his origin, and we shall not tell the history of the birth of Hunapu and Exbalanke. We shall tell only half of it, only a part of the history of his father. Here is the story, 
Here are the names of Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu, as they are called. Their parents were Ixpiakok and Ixmukane. During the night, Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu were born of Ixpiakok and Ixmukane. Well now, Hun Hunapu had begotten two sons. The first was called Hun Bats, and the second Hun Shuen. The mother of the two sons was called Exbakyalo. Thus was the wife of Hun Hunapu called. As for the other son, Vukub Hunapu, he had no wife. He was single. By nature, these two sons were very wise, and great was their wisdom. On earth, they were soothsayers of good disposition and good habits. All the arts were taught to Hunbats and Hunshuen, the sons of Hun Hunapu. They were flautists, singers, shooters with blowguns, painters, sculptors, jewelers, and silversmiths. These were Hunbats and Hunshuen. Well, Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu did nothing but play dice and ball all day long, and when the four got together to play ball, one pair played against the other pair. And Vok, the messenger of Hurakan of Chipikakulha, of Raksakakulha, came there to watch them, but Vok did not stay far from the earth nor far from Shibalba. Seven, and in an instant he went up to heaven, to the side of Hurakan. They were still here on earth when the mother of Hunbats and Hunshuen died. The lords of Shibalba, Hunkame, and Vukubkame overheard them playing ball on the way to Shibalba. What are they doing on earth? Who are they who are making the earth shake and making so much noise? Go and call them. Let them come here to play ball. Here we will overpower them. We are no longer respected by them. They no longer have consideration or fear of our rank, and they even fight above our heads, said all the lords of Shibalba. All of them held a council, those called Hunkame and Vukubkame were the supreme judges. All the lords had been assigned their duties. Hunkame and Vukubkame gave each person his own authority. They were then Shikiripat and Kuchumakik lords of these names. They were the two who caused the shedding of blood of the men. Others were called Ahalpu and Ahalgana, also lords. Their work was to make men swell and make pus gush forth from their legs and stain their faces yellow, what is called Chuganal. Such was the work of Ahalpu and Ahalgana. Others were Lord Shamiabak and Lord Shamiaholom, constables of Shibalba whose staffs were of bone. Their work was to make men waste away until they were nothing but skin and bone, and they died, and they carried them, with their stomachs and bones stretched out. This was the work of Chamiabak and Chamiaholom, as they were called. Others were called Lord Ahalmez and Lord Ahaltokob. Their work was to bring disaster upon men as they were going home or in front of it, and they would be found wounded, stretched out, face up on the ground, dead. This was the work of Ahalmez and Ahaltokob, as they were called. Immediately after them were other lords named Sheik and Patan, whose work it was to cause men to die on the road, which is called sudden death, making blood rush to their mouths until they died vomiting blood. The work of each one of these lords was to seize upon them and squeeze their throats and chests, so that the men died on the road, making the blood rush to their throats when they were walking. This was the work of Sheik and Patan. And having gathered in council, they discussed how to torment and wound Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu. What the lords of Shibalba coveted were the playing implements of Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu. Their leather pads and rings and gloves and crowns and masks, which were the playing gear of Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu. Now we shall tell of their journey to Shibalba and how they left behind them the sons of Hun Hunapu, Hun Bats, and Hun Shuen, whose mother had died. Then we'll explain how Hunap and Ixbalanke defeated Hun Bats and Hun Shuen. The messengers of Hun Kame and Vukub Kame arrived immediately. Go, Apop Achi, they were told. Go and call Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu. Say to them, Come with us. The lords say that you must come. 
They must come here to play ball with us, so that they shall make us happy, for really they amaze us. So then they must come, said the lords, and have them bring their playing gear, their rings, their gloves, and have them bring their rubber balls too, said the lords. Tell them to come quickly, they told the messengers. And these messengers were owls, Chabi Tukur, Hurakan Tukur, Kakix Tukur, and Holom Tukur. These were the names of the messengers of Shibalba. Chabi Tukur was swift as an arrow. Hurakan Tukur had only one leg. Kakix Tukur had a red back, and Holom Tukur had only a head, no legs, but he had wings. The four messengers had the rank of Apop Achi. Leaving Shibalba, they arrived quickly bringing their message to the court where Hunhunapu and Vukub Hunapu were playing ball at the ball court, which was called Nim Zob Kaka. The owl messengers went directly to the ball court and delivered their message exactly as it was given to them by Hunkame, Vukubkame, Ahalpu, Ahalgana, Chamiabak, Chamiaholom, Shikiripat, Kuchumakik, Ahalmez, Ahal Tokob, Zik and Patan as the lords were called, who sent the message by the owls. Did the lords Hunkame and Vukubkame really say that we must go with you? They certainly said so, and let them bring all their playing gear, the lords said. Very well, said the youths, wait for us, we are only going to say goodbye to our mother. And having gone straight home, they said to their mother, for their father was dead, We are going, our mother, but our going is only for a while. The messengers of the Lord have come to take us. They must come, they said, according to the messengers. We shall leave our ball here in pledge, they added. They went immediately to hang it in the space under the rooftop. We will return to play, they said. And going to Hunbats and Hunchuen, they said to them, Keep on playing the flute and singing, painting and carving. Warm our house and warm the heart of your grandmother. When they took leave of their mother, Xmukani was moved and burst into tears. Do not worry, we are going, but we have not died yet, said Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu as they left. Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu went immediately, and the messengers took them on the road. Thus they were descending the road to Shibalba by some very steep stairs. They went down until they came to the bank of a river, which flowered rapidly between, the ravenous call it Nusivan, Kul, and Kuzivan, and crossed it. Then they crossed the river, which flowered among thorny calabash trees. There were very many calabash trees, but they passed through them without hurting themselves. Then they came to the bank of a river of blood, and crossed it without drinking its waters. They only went to the river bank, so they were not overcome. They went on until they came to where four roads joined, and there, at the crossroads, they were overcome. One of the four roads was red, another black, another white, and another yellow. And the black road said to them, I am the one you must take, because I am the way of the Lord. So said the road. And from here on, they were already overcome. They were taken over the road to Sibalba. And when they arrived at the council room of the lords of Shibalba, they had already lost the match. Well, the first people seated there were only wooden figures that the men of Shibalba had arranged. These they welcomed first. How are you, Hunkame? they said to the wooden man. How are you, Vukubkame? they said to the other wooden man, but they did not answer. Instantly the lords of Sibalba burst into laughter, and all the other lords began to laugh loudly because they already took for granted the downfall and defeat of Hunhunapu and Vukubhunapu, and they continued to laugh. Then Hunchame and Vukubchame spoke. Very well, they said. You have come. Tomorrow you shall prepare the mask, your rings, and your gloves, they said. Come and sit down on our bench, they said, but the bench which they offered them was of hot stone, and when they sat down they were burned. They began to squirm around on the bench, and if they had not stood up they would have burned their seats. The lords of Shibalba burst out laughing again. They were dying of laughter. They writhed from pain in their stomach, in their blood, and in their bones caused by their laughter. 
All the lords of Shibalba laughed. Go now to that house, they said. There you will get your sticks of fat peen and your cigar, and there you shall sleep. Immediately they arrived at the house of gloom. There was only darkness within the house. Meanwhile, the lords of Shibalba discussed what they should do. Let us sacrifice them tomorrow. Let them die quickly, quickly, so that we can have their playing gear to use in play, said the lords of Shibalba to each other. Well, their fat pine sticks were round and were called Zakitok, which is the pine of Shibalba. Their fat pine sticks were pointed and filed and were as bright as bone. The pine of Shibalba was very hard. Hunhunapu and Vukubhunapu entered the house of gloom. There they were given their fat pine sticks, a single lighted stick which Hunkame and Vukubkame sent them, together with a lighted cigar for each of them which the lords had sent. They went to give them to Hunhunapu and Vukubhunapu. They found them crouching in the darkness when the porters arrived with the fat pine sticks and the cigars. As they entered, the pine sticks lighted the place brightly. Each of you light your pine sticks and your cigars. Come and bring them back at dawn. You must not burn them up, but you must return them whole. This is what the lords told us to say. So they said, and so they were defeated. They burned up the pine sticks, and they also finished the cigars which had been given to them. There were many punishments in Shibalba. The punishments were of many kinds. The first was the House of Gloom, Kekumaha, in which there was only darkness. The second was Zukshulimha, the house where everybody shivered in which it was very cold. A cold, unbearable wind blew within. The third was the house of jaguars, Balamiha, it was called, in which there was nothing but jaguars which stalked about, jumped around, roared and made fun. The jaguars were shut up in the house. Zotsiha, the house of bats, the fourth place of punishment was called. Within this house there was nothing but bats that squeaked and cried and flew around and around. The bats were shut in and could not get out. The fifth was called Chayim Ha, the house of knives, in which there were only sharp pointed knives, silent or grating against each other in the house. There were many places of torture in Shibalba, but Hunhunapu and Vukubhunapu did not enter them. We only mention the names of these houses of punishment. When Hunhunapu and Vukubhunapu came before Hunkame and Vukubkame, they said, Where are my cigars? Where are my sticks of fat pine which I gave you last night? They are all gone, sir. Well, today shall be the end of your days. Now you shall die. You shall be destroyed, we will break you into pieces, and here your faces will stay hidden. You shall be sacrificed, said Hunkame and Vukubkame. They sacrificed them immediately and buried them in the Pukbalcha, as it was called. Before burying them, they cut off the head of Hunhunapu and buried the older brother together with the younger brother. Take the head and put it in that tree which is planted on the road, said Hunkame and Vukubkame. And having put the head in the tree, instantly the tree, which had never borne fruit before the head of Hunhunapu, was placed among its branches, was covered with fruit. And this calabash tree, it is said, is the one which we now call the head of Hunhunapu. Hunkame and Vukubkame looked in amazement at the fruit on the tree. The round fruit was everywhere, but they did not recognize the head of Hunhunapu. It was exactly like the other fruit of the calabash tree. So it seemed to all of the people of Shibalba when they came to look at it. According to their judgment, the tree was miraculous because of what had instantly occurred when they put Hunhunapu's head among its branches. And the lords of Shibalba said, Let no one come to pick this fruit. Let no one come and sit under this tree, they said. And so the lords of Shibalba resolved to keep everybody away. The head of Hun Hunahpu did not appear again because it had become one and the same as the fruit of the gourd tree. Nevertheless, a girl heard the wonderful story. Now we shall tell you about her arrival. This is the story of a maiden, the daughter of a lord named Kushumaquik. A maiden, then daughter of a lord, heard this story. 
The name of the father was Kuchumakik, and that of the maiden was Kexquik. When she heard the story of the fruit of the tree which her father told, she was amazed to hear it. Why can I not go to see this tree which they tell about? the girl exclaimed. Surely the fruit of which I hear tell must be very good. Finally, she went alone and arrived at the foot of the tree that had been planted in Pukbalcha. Ah, she exclaimed, what fruit is this which this tree bears? Is it not wonderful to see how it is covered with fruit? Must I die? Shall I be lost if I pick one of this fruit? said the maiden. Then the skull, which was among the branches of the tree, spoke up and said, What is it you wish? Those round objects which cover the branches of the trees are nothing but skulls. So spoke the head of Hunhunapu, turning to the maiden. Do you, perchance, want them? it added. Yes, I want them, the maiden answered. Very well, said the skull. Stretch your right hand up here. Very well, said the maiden, and with her right hand reached toward the skull. In that instant the skull let a few drops of spittle fall directly into the maiden's palm. She looked quickly and intently at the palm of her hand, but the spittle of the skull was not there. In my saliva and spittle I have given you my descendants, said the voice in the tree. Now my head has nothing on it any more. It is nothing but a skull without flesh. So are the heads of the great princes. The flesh is all that gives them a handsome appearance, and when they die men are frightened by their bones. So too is the nature of the sons, which are like saliva and spittle. They may be sons of a lord, of a wise man, or of an orator. They do not lose their substance when they go, but they bequeath it. The image of the lord, of the wise man, or of the orator does not disappear, nor is it lost, but he leaves it to the daughters and to the sons which he begets. I have done the same with you. Go up then to the surface of the earth, that you may not die. Believe in my words that it will be so, said the head of Hunhunapu and of Vukubhunapu. And all that they did together was by order of Hura Khan, Chippi Kakulha, and Raksa Kakulha. After all of the above talking, the maiden returned directly to her home, having immediately conceived the sons in her belly by virtue of the spittle only. And thus Hunapu and Xbalanke were begotten. And so the girl returned home, and after six months had passed, her father, who was called Kuchumakik, noticed her condition. When the maiden's father noticed that she was pregnant, he immediately learned her secret. Then the lords Hunkame and Vukubkame held a council with Kuchumakik. My daughter is pregnant, sirs. She has been disgraced, exclaimed Kuchumakik when he appeared before the lords. Very well, they said. Command her to tell the truth, and if she refuses to speak, punish her. Let her be taken far from here and sacrifice her. Very well, honorable lords, he answered. Then he questioned his daughter. Whose are the children that you carry, my daughter? And she answered, I have no child, my father, for I have not yet known a youth. Very well, he replied. You are really a whore. Take her and sacrifice her, Apopachi. Bring me her heart in a gourd and return this very day before the lords, he said to the two owls. The four messengers took the gourd and set out carrying the young girl in their arms and also taking the knife of flint with which to sacrifice her. And she said to them, It cannot be that you will kill me, O messengers, because what I bear in my belly is no disgrace, but was begotten when I went to marvel at the head of Hunhunapu which was in Pukbalcha. So then you must not sacrifice me, O messengers, said the young girl, turning to them. And what shall we put in place of your heart? Your father told us, bring the heart, return before the lords, do your duty, all working together, bring it in the gourd quickly, and put the heart in the bottom of the gourd. Perchance, did he not speak to us so? What shall we put in the gourd? We wish too that you should not die, said the messengers. Very well, but my heart does not belong to them. Neither is your home here, nor must you let them force you to kill men. 
Later, in truth, the real criminals will be at your mercy, and I will overcome Hun Kame and Vukub Kame. So then the blood and only the blood shall be theirs, and shall be given to them. Neither shall my heart be burned before them. Gather the product of this tree, said the maiden. The red sap gushing forth from the tree fell in the gourd, and with it they made a ball which glistened and took the shape of a heart. The tree gave forth sap, similar to blood, with the appearance of real blood. Then the blood, or that is to say the sap of the red tree, clotted and formed a very bright coating inside the gourd, like clotted blood. Meanwhile the tree glowed at the work of the maiden. It was called the Red Tree of Cochineal, but since then it has taken the name Blood Tree because its sap is called blood. There on earth you shall be beloved, and you shall have all that belongs to you, said the maiden to the owls. Very well, girl, we shall go there, we go up to serve you. You continue on your way, while we go to present the sap, instead of your heart, to the lords, said the messengers. When they arrived in the presence of the lords, all were waiting. You have finished, asked Hunkame. All is finished, my lords, here in the bottom of the gourd is the heart. Very well, let us see, exclaimed Hunkame, and grasping it with his fingers, he raised it. The shell broke, and the blood flowed bright red in color. Stir up the fire and put it on the coals, said Hunkame. As soon as they threw it on the fire, the men of Shibalba began to sniff and draw near to it. They found the fragrance of the heart very sweet. And as they sat deep in thought, the owls, the maiden servants, left and flew like a flock of birds from the abyss toward earth, and the four became her servants. In this manner, the lords of Shibalba were defeated. The maiden tricked everyone. Well then, Hunbats and Hunchuen were with their mother when the woman called Esquich arrived. When the woman Esquich came before the mother of Hunbats and Hunchuen, she carried her sons in her belly, and it was not long before Hunapu and Isbalonke, as they were called, were to be born. When the woman came to the old lady, she said to her, I have come, mother, I am your daughter-in-law and your daughter-mother. She said this when she entered the grandmother's house. Where did you come from? Where are my sons? Did they perchance not die in Jibalba? Do you not see these two who remain, their descendants and blood, and are called Hunbats and Hunchuen? Go from here! Get out! the old lady screamed at the girl. Nevertheless, it is true that I am your daughter-in-law. I have been for a long time. I belong to Hun Hunapu. They live in what I carry. Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu are not dead. They will return to show themselves clearly, my mother-in-law, and you shall soon see their image in what I bring to you, she said to the old woman. Then Hunbats and Hunchuen became angry. They did nothing but play the flute and sing, paint and sculpture all day long, and were the consolation of the older woman. Then the old woman said, I do not wish you to be my daughter-in-law because what you bear in your womb is fruit of your disgrace. Furthermore, you are an impostor. My sons of whom you speak are already dead. Presently, the grandmother added, This, that I tell you, is the truth. But well, it is all right. You are my daughter-in-law, according to what I have heard. Go then, bring the food for those who must be fed. Go and gather a large net full of corn, and return at once, since you are my daughter-in-law, according to what I hear, she said to the girl. Very well, the girl replied, and she went at once to the cornfield that Hunbats and Hunchuen had planted. They had opened the road, and the girl took it, and so came to the cornfield, but she found only one stalk of corn. There were not two or three, and when she saw that there was only one stalk with an ear on it, the girl became very anxious. Ah, sinner that I am, unfortunate me! Where must I go to get a net full of corn as she told me to do? she exclaimed. Immediately she began to beg Chahal for the food she had to get and must take back. Exto, excanil, excacao, you who cook the corn, and you, Chahal, guardian of the food of Hunbats and Hanshuen, said the girl, 
and then she seized the beards, the red silk of the ears of corn, and pulled them off without picking the ear. Then she arranged the silk in the net, like ears of corn, and the large net was completely filled. The girl returned immediately. The animals of the field went along carrying the net, and when they arrived, they went to put the load in the corner of the house, as though she might have carried it. The older woman came, and when she saw the corn in the large net, she exclaimed, Where have you brought all this corn from? Did you perchance take all the corn in our field and bring it all in? I shall go at once to see, said the old woman, and she set out on the road to the cornfield. But the one stalk of corn was still standing there, and she saw too where the net had been at the foot of the stalk. The older woman quickly returned to her house and said to the girl, This is proof enough that you are really my daughter-in-law. I shall now see your little ones, those whom you carry, and who also are to be soothsayers, she said to the girl. Now we shall tell of the birth of Hunapu and Ixbalanke. Here then we shall tell about their birth. When the day of their birth arrived, the girl named Ixquich gave birth, but the grandmother did not see them when they were born. Instantly the two boys called Hunapu and Ixbalanke were born. There, in the woods, they were born. Then they came to the house, but they could not sleep. Go throw them out, said the old woman, because truly they cry very much. Then they went and put them on an ant hill. There they slept peacefully. Then they took them from the ant hill and laid them on thistles. Now what Hunbats and Hunshuen wished was that Hunapu and Ixbalanke would die there on the ant hill or on the thistles. They wished this because of the hatred and envy Hunbats and Hunshuen felt for them. At first they refused to receive their younger brothers in the house. They would not recognize them, and so they were brought up in the fields. Humbats and Hunchuen were great musicians and singers. They had grown up in the midst of trials and want, and they had had much trouble. But they became very wise. They were flautists, singers, painters, and carvers. All of this they knew how to do. They had heard about their birth and knew also that they were the successors of their parents, those who went to Shibalba and died there. Hunbats and Hunchoen were diviners and in their hearts they knew everything concerning the birth of their two younger brothers. Nevertheless, because they were envious, they did not show their wisdom, and their hearts were filled with bad will for them, although Hunapu and Ixbalanke had not offended them in any way. These two last did nothing all day long but shoot their blowguns. They were not loved by their grandmother, nor by Hunbats, nor by Hunshuhen. They were given nothing to eat, only when the meal was ended and Hunbats and Hunshuhen had already eaten, then the younger. Brothers came to eat, but they did not become angry, nor did they become vexed, but suffered silently because they knew their rank, and they understood everything clearly. They brought their birds when they came, and Hunbats and Hunshuen ate them without giving anything to either of the two, Hunapu and Ixbalanke. The only thing that Hunbats and Hunshuen did was play the flute and sing, and once, when Hunapu and Exbalanke came without bringing any bird at all, they went into the house, and their grandmother became furious. Why did you bring no birds? she said to Hunapu and Exbalanke. And they answered, What happened, grandmother, is that our birds were caught in the tree, and we could not climb up to get them, dear grandmother. If our elder brothers so wish, let them come with us to bring the birds down, they said. Very well, the older brothers answered, we shall go with you at dawn. The two younger brothers then discussed the way to overcome Hunbats and Hunshuwen. We shall only change their nature, their appearance, and so let our word be fulfilled for all the suffering that they have caused us. They wanted us to die, that we might be lost, we, their younger brothers. In their hearts, they really believe that we have come to be their servants. For these reasons, we shall overcome them and teach them a lesson. Thus they spoke. Then they went towards the foot of the tree called Kante. 
Their two older brothers were with them, and they shot their blowguns. It was not possible to count the birds that sang in the tree, and their elder brothers marveled at seeing so many birds. There were birds, but not one fell at the foot of the tree. Our birds do not fall to the ground. Go and fetch them down, they said to their elder brothers. Very well, the latter answered. And then they climbed the tree, but the tree became larger, and the trunk swelled. Then Hunbats and Hunchuen wanted to come down, but they could not come down from the top of the tree. Then they called from the treetop, What has happened to us, our brothers? Unfortunate we, this tree frightens us only to look at it. Oh, our brothers, they called from the treetop. And Hunapu and Exbalanke answered, Loosen your breech clouts, tie them below your stomach, leaving the long ends hanging, and pull these from behind, and in this way you can walk easily. Thus said the younger brothers. Very well, they answered, pulling the ends of their belts back, but instantly these were changed into tails, and they took on the appearance of monkeys. Then they hopped over the branches of the trees, among the great woods and little woods, and they buried themselves in the forest, making faces and swinging in the branches of the trees. In this way, Hunap and Exbalanke defeated Hunbats and Hunchuen, and they were only able to do so because of their magic. Then they returned to their home, and when they arrived, they spoke to their grandmother and their mother and said to them, what could it be, grandmother, that has happened to our elder brothers, that suddenly their faces turned into the faces of animals? So they said, If you have done any harm to your elder brothers, you have hurt me and have filled me with sadness. Do not do such a thing to your brothers. O oh, my children, said the old woman to Hunapu and Exbalanke. And they replied to their grandmother, Do not grieve our grandmother. You shall see our brothers' faces again. They shall return, but it will be a difficult trial for you, grandmother. Be careful that you do not laugh at them. And now let us cast our lot, they said. Immediately they began to play their flutes, playing the song of Hunapu Koi. Then they sang, playing the flute and drum, picking up their flutes and their drum. Afterwards they sat down close to their grandmother and continued playing and calling back their brothers with music and song, intoning the song called Hunahpu Koi. At last Hunbats and Hunchuen came and began to dance, but when the older woman saw their ugly faces, she began to laugh, unable to control her laughter, and they went away at once, and she did not see their faces again. Now you see, Grandmother, they have gone to the forest. What have you done, Grandmother of ours? We may conduct this trial, but there are only three of us left. Let us call them back again with a flute and a song. But you try to control your laughter. Let the trial begin, said Hunapu and Ixbalanke. Immediately they began again to play. Hunbats and Hunchuen returned dancing and came as far as the center of the court of the house, grimacing and provoking their grandmother to laughter, until, finally, she broke into loud laughter. They were really very amusing with their monkey faces, their broad bottoms, their narrow tails, and the hole in their stomach, all of which made the older woman laugh. Again, the elder brothers went back to the woods, and Hunapu and Exbalanke said, and now what shall we do, grandmother? We shall try once again this third time. They played the flute again, and the monkeys returned, dancing. The grandmother contained her laughter. Then they went up over the kitchen. Their eyes gave off a red light. They drew away and scrubbed their noses and frightened each other with the faces they made. As the grandmother saw all of this, she burst into violent laughter, and they did not see the faces of the elder brothers again because of the older woman's laughter. Only once more shall we call them grandmother, so that they shall come for the fourth time, said the boys. They began again then to play the flute, but their brothers did not return the fourth time. Instead, they fled into the forest as quickly as they could. The boys said to their grandmother, We have done everything possible, dear grandmother. They came once, then we tried to call them again. But do not grieve, here we are, your grandchildren. 
you must look to us, O oh, our mother, O oh, our grandmother, to remind you of, our elder brothers, those who were called and have the names of Hunbats and Hunshuen, said Hunapu and ex Balanke. They were invoked by the musicians and singers and by the older adults. The painters and artisans also invoked them in days gone by, but they were changed into animals and became monkeys because they became arrogant and abused their brothers. In this way they were disgraced, this was their loss. In this way Hunbats and Hunchuen were overcome and became animals. They had always lived in their home. They were musicians and singers, and also did great things when they lived with their grandmother and with their mother. Then they Hunapu and Exbalanke began to work in order to be well thought of by their grandmother and their mother. The first thing they made was the cornfield. We are going to plant the cornfield, grandmother and mother, they said. Do not grieve. Here we are, your grandchildren, we who shall take the place of our brothers, said Hunapu and Xbalanke. At once they took their axes, their picks, and their wooden hoes, and went, each carrying his blowgun on his shoulder. As they left the house, they asked their grandmother to bring them their midday meal. At midday, come and bring our food, grandmother, they said. Very well, my grandsons, the old woman replied. Soon they came to the field, and as they plunged the pick into the earth, it worked the earth, it did the work alone. In the same way, they put the axe in the trunks of the trees and in the branches, and instantly they fell, and all the trees and vines were lying on the ground. The trees fell quickly, with only one stroke of the axe. The pick also dug a great deal. One could not count the thistles and brambles, which had been felled with one blow of the pick. Neither was it possible to tell what it had dug and broken up in all the large and small woods. And having taught an animal called Xmukur, they had it climb to the top of a large tree, and Hunapu and Xbalanke said to it, Watch for our grandmother to come with our food, and as soon as she comes, begin at once to sing, and we shall seize the pick and the axe. Very well, Xmukur answered, and they began to shoot with their blowguns. Certainly they did none of the work of clearing and cultivating. A little later, the dove sang, and they ran quickly, grabbing the pick and axe. One of them covered his head, and also deliberately covered his hands with earth, and in the same way smeared his face to look like a real laborer, and the other purposely threw splinters of wood over his head, as though he really had been cutting the trees. Thus their grandmother saw them, they ate at once, but they had yet to really do the work of tilling the soil, and without deserving it, they were given their midday meal. After a while, they went home. We are really tired, grandmother, they said upon arriving, stretching their legs and arms before her, but without reason. They returned the following day, and upon arriving at the field, they found that all the trees and vines were standing again, and that the brambles and thistles had become entangled again. Who has played this trick on us? They said, no doubt all the small and large animals did it, the puma, the jaguar, the deer, the rabbit, the mountain cat, the coyote, the wild boar, the coati, the small birds, the large birds. They, it was, who did it? In a single night, they did it. They began again to prepare the field and to prepare the soil and cut the trees. They talked over what they would have to do with the trees which they had cut and the weeds which they had pulled up. Now we shall watch over our cornfield. Perhaps we can surprise those who come to do all of this damage, they said, talking it over together. Later, they returned home. What do you think of it, Grandmother? They have made fun of us. Our field, which we had worked, has been turned into a field of stubble and a thick woods. Thus we found it when we got there a little while ago. Grandmother, they said to her and to their mother, but we shall return there and watch over it, because it is not right that they do such things to us, they said. Then they dressed and returned at once to their field of cut trees, and there they hid themselves, stealthily, in the darkness. Then all the animals gathered again, one of each kind came with the other, small and large animals.
It was just midnight when they came, all talking as they came, saying in their own language, Rise up, trees! Rise up, vines! So they spoke when they came, and gathered under the trees, under the vines, and they came closer until they appeared before the eyes of Hunapu and Exbalanque. The puma and the jaguar were the first, and Hunapu and Exbalanque wanted to seize them, but the animals did not let them. Then the deer and the rabbit came close, and the only parts of them that they could seize were their tails. They pulled out only these. The height of the deer remained in their hands, and for this reason the deer and the rabbit have short tails. Neither the mountain cat, the coyote, the wild boar, nor the coati fell into their hands. All the animals passed before Hunapu and Exbalanque, who were furious because they could not catch them. But finally, another animal came hopping along, and this one which was the rat, which they seized instantly and wrapped him in a cloth. Then, when they had caught him, they squeezed his head and tried to choke him, and they burned his tall in the fire, and for that reason the rat's tail has no hair. So too the boys, Hunapu and Ixbalonke, tried to poke at his eyes. The rat said, I must not die at your hands, and neither is it your business to plant the cornfield. What are you telling us now? the boys asked the rat. Loosen me a little, for I have something which I wish to tell you and I shall tell you immediately. But first give me something to eat, said the rat. We will give you food afterward, but first speak, they answered. Very well. Do you know, then, that the property of your parents, Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu, as they were called, those who died in Shibalba, or rather the gear with which they played ball, has remained and is hanging from the roof of the house, the ring, the gloves, and the ball? Nevertheless, your grandmother does not want to show them to you, for it was on account of these things that your parents died. Are you sure of that? said the boys to the rat, and they were very happy when they heard about the rubber ball. And as the rat had now talked, they showed the rat what his food would be. This shall be your food, corn, chili seeds, beans, palat, cacao. All this belongs to you, and should there be anything stored away or forgotten, it shall be yours also. Eat it, Hunapu and Exbalanque said to the rat. Wonderful, boys, he said, but what shall I tell your grandmother if she sees me? Do not worry, because we are here and shall know what to say to our grandmother. Let us go. We shall go quickly to the comer of the house, go at once to where the things hang. We shall be looking at the garret of the house and paying attention to our food, they said to the rat. And having arranged it thus, during the night after talking together, Hunapu and Sbalanke arrived at midday. When they arrived, they brought the rat with them, but they did not show it. One of them went directly into the house, and the other went to the corner and let the rat climb up quickly. Immediately they asked their grandmother for food. Prepare our food. We wish a chili sauce, grandmother, they said. And at once the food was prepared for them, and a plate of broth was put before them. But this was only to deceive their grandmother and their mother, and having dried up the water which was in the water jar, they said, We are really dying of thirst. Go and bring us a drink, they said to their grandmother. Good, she said and went. Then they began to eat, but they were not really hungry. It was only a trick. They saw then, by means of their plate of chile, how the rat went rapidly toward the ball, which was suspended from the roof of the house. On seeing this in their chile sauce, they sent to the river a certain man, an animal called Zan, which is like a mosquito, to puncture the side of their grandmother's water jar, and although she tried to stop the water, which ran out, she could not close the hole made in the jar. What is the matter with our grandmother? Our mouths are dry with thirst. We are dying of thirst, they said to their mother, and they sent her out. Immediately the rat went to cut the cord which held the ball, and it fell from the garret of the house together with the ring and the gloves and the leather pads. 
The boys seized them and ran quickly to hide them on the road which led to the ball court. After this, they went to the river to join their grandmother and their mother, who were busily trying to stop the hole in the water jar. And arriving with their blowgun, they said when they came to the river, What are you doing? We got tired of waiting and we came, they said. Look at the hole in my jar which I cannot stop, said the grandmother. Instantly they stopped it, and together they returned, the two walking before their grandmother, and in this way the ball was found. The boys returned happily to the ball court to play. They were playing alone for a long time, and cleared the court where their parents had played. And the lords of Shibalba, hearing them, said, Who are they? who play again over our heads and disturb us with the noise they make. Perchance Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu did not die. Those who wish to exalt themselves before us, go at once and call them. So said Hun Kame, Vukub Kame, and all the lords. And sending the messengers to call them, they said to them, Go and tell them when you get there. Let them come, the lords have said. We wish to play ball with them here. Within seven days we wish to play. Tell them so when you arrive. Thus said the lords. This was the command which they gave to the messengers. And they came then by the wide road which the boys had made that led directly to their house. By it, the messengers arrived directly before the boys' grandmother. They were eating when the messengers from Shibalba arrived. Tell them to come without fail, the lords commanded, said the messengers of Shibalba. And the messengers of Shibalba indicated the day. Within seven days they will await them, they said to Smukane. It is well, messengers, they will go, the old woman answered. And the messengers set out on their return. Then the older woman's heart was filled with anxiety. Who shall I send to call my grandchildren? Was it not in this same way that the messengers of Shibalba came before when they came to take the boy's parents, said the grandmother, entering her house alone and grieving, and immediately a louse fell into her lap. She seized it and put it in the palm of her hand, and the louse wriggled and began to walk. My child, would you like me to send you away to call my grandchildren from the ball court, she said to the louse. Messengers have come to your grandmother, tell them. Come within seven days. Tell them to come, said the messengers of Shibalba. Thus your grandmother told me to say, she told the louse. At once the louse swaggered off. Sitting on the road was a boy called Tamazul, or the toad. Where are you going? the toad said to the louse. I'm carrying a message in my stomach. I go to find the boys, said the louse to Tamazul. Very well, but I see that you do not go quickly, said the toad to the louse. Do you not want me to swallow you? You shall see how I run, and so we shall arrive quickly. Very well, the louse said to the toad. Immediately the toad swallowed him, and the toad walked a long time but without hurrying. Soon he met a large snake called Zakwikaz. Where are you going, young Tamazul? said Zakwikaz to the toad. I go as a messenger, I carry a message in my stomach, said the toad to the snake. See that you walk slowly. Would I not arrive sooner? the snake said to the toad. Come here, he said. At once Zakikaz swallowed the toad. From then on, this was the food of snakes, who still swallow toads today. The snake went quickly, and having met Vak, which is a very large bird, the hawk instantly swallowed the snake. Shortly afterwards, it arrived at the ball court. Since then, this has been the food of hawks, who devour snakes in the fields. Upon arrival, the hawk perched upon the cornice of the ball court, where Hunapu and Exbalanke were amusing themselves playing ball. Upon arriving, the hawk began to cry, Vako, Vako, it said, cawing, Here is the hawk, here is the hawk. Who is screaming? Bring our blowguns! the boys exclaimed. Shooting at the hawk, they aimed a pellet at the pupil of the eye, and the hawk spiraled to the ground. They ran to seize it and asked, What do you come to do here? they asked the hawk. I have a message in my stomach. First cure my eye, and afterwards I shall tell you, the hawk answered. 
Very well, they said, and taking a bit of the rubber of the ball with which they were playing, they put it in the hawk's eye. Lots quick, they called it, and instantly the hawk's eye was perfectly healed. Speak then, they said to the hawk, and immediately it vomited a large snake. Speak thou, they said to the snake. Good, the snake said, vomiting at the toad. Where is the message that you bring? they asked the toad. Here in my stomach is the message, answered the toad. And immediately he tried but could not vomit. His mouth was only filled with spittle, but he did not vomit. The boys wanted to hit him then. You are a liar, they said, kicking him in the rump, and the bone of the haunches gave way. He tried again, but his mouth only filled with spittle. Then the boys opened the toad's mouth, and once they opened it, they looked inside it. The louse was stuck to the toad's teeth. It had stayed. In its mouth it had not been swallowed, but only pretended to be swallowed. Thus the toad was tricked, and the kind of food to give it is not known. It cannot run, and it became the food of the snakes. Speak, they said to the louse, and then it gave its message. Your grandmother has said, boys, go call them. The messengers of Hun Kame and Vukub Kame have come to tell them to go to Shibalba, saying they must come here within seven days to play ball with us, and they must also bring their playing gear, the ball, the rings, the gloves, and the leather pads, in order that they may amuse themselves here, said the lords. They have really come, said your grandmother, that is why I have come, for truly your grandmother said this, and she cries and grieves. For this reason, I have come. Is it true? The boys asked themselves when they heard this. Running quickly, they arrived at their grandmother's side. They went only to take their leave of her. We are going, grandmother. We came only to say goodbye. But here will be the sign which we shall leave of our fate. Each of us shall plant a reed. In the middle of the house we shall plant it. If it dries, this shall be the sign of our death. They are dead, you shall say, if it begins to dry up. But if it sprouts again, they are living, you shall say, O oh, our grandmother. And you, mother, do not weep, for here we leave the sign of our fate, they said. And before going, Hunapu planted one reed, and Exbalanke planted another. They planted them in the house, and not in the field nor did they plant them in moist soil, but in dry soil. In the middle of their house they left them planted. Then they went, each carrying his blowgun, and went down in the direction of Shibalba. They descended the steps quickly, and passed between several streams and ravines. They passed among some birds, and these birds were called mole. They also passed over a river of corruption and over a river of blood, where they would be destroyed, the people of Shibalba thought, but they did not touch it with their feet. Instead, they crossed it on their blowguns. They went on from there and came to a crossroads of four roads. They knew very well which roads to Shibalba were, the Black Road, the White Road, the Red Road, and the Green Road. So then, they sent an animal called Zan. It was to gather the information that they wanted. Sting them one by one, first sting the one seated in the first place, and then sting all of them, since. This is the part you must play, to suck the blood of the men on the roads, they said to the mosquito. Very well, answered the mosquito. Immediately, it flew on to the dark road and went directly towards the wooden men, who were seated first and covered with ornaments. It stung the first, but this one said nothing. Then it stung the next one, it stung the second, who was seated, but this one said nothing either. After that, it stung the third. The third of those seated was Hun Kame. Ah! he exclaimed when it stung him. What is this, Hun Kame? What is it that has stung you? Do you not know who has stung you? said the fourth one of the lords, who was seated. What is the matter, Vukub Kame? What has stung you? said the fifth. Ah, ah, said Jiquiripat. And Vukub Kame asked him, What has stung you? And when they stung the sixth, who was seated, he cried, 
Ah! What is this, Kuchumakik? asked Chikuripat. What is it that has stung you? And the seventh one seated said, Ah! when he was stung. What is the matter, Ahalpa? said Kuchumakik. What has stung you? And when it stung him, the eighth of those seated said, Ah! What is the matter, Ahalkana? said Ahalpa. What has stung you? And when he was stung, the ninth of those seated said, Ah! What is this, Chamiabak? said Ahalkana. What has stung you? And when the tenth of those seated was stung, he said, Ah! What is the matter, Chamiaholam? said Chamiabak. What has stung you? And when the eleventh of those seated was stung, he said, Ah! What happened? said Chamiaholam. What has stung you? And when the twelfth of those seated was stung, he said, Alas! What is this, Patan? they said, Wa. What has stung you? And the thirteenth of those seated said, Alas! when he was stung. What is the matter, Kixik? said Patan. What has stung you? And the fourteenth of those seated when he was stung said, Alas! What has stung you, Quikrikak? said Quikre. In this way they told their names, as they all said them one after the other. So they made themselves known by telling their names and calling each chief one by one. And in this manner each of those seated in his chair told his name. Not a single one of the names was missed. All told their names when Hunapu puffed out a hair from his leg, which was what had stung them. It was really not a mosquito that stung them, which went for Hunapu and Exbalanke to hear the names of all of them. The youths continued on their way and arrived where the lords of Shibalba were. Greet the lord, the one who is seated, said one in order to deceive them. That is not a lord, it is nothing more than a wooden figure, they said, and went on. Immediately they began to greet them. Hail Hankame, hail Vukubkame, hail Shikwiripat, hail Kuchumakik, hail Ahalpu, hail Ahalkana, hail Chamiabak, hail Chamiaholam, hail Quixik, hail Patan, hail Quikre, hail Quikrikak, they said coming before them, and looking into their faces they spoke the names of all of them, without missing the name of a single one of them. But what the lords wished was that they should not discover their names. Sit here, they said, hoping that they would sit in the seat which they indicated. That is not a seat for us, it is only a hot stone, said Hunapu and Exbalanke, and they, the lords of Shibalba, could not overcome them. Very well, go to that house, the lord said, and the youths went on and entered the house of gloom, and neither there were they overcome. This was the first test for Shibalba. The lords of Shibalba thought that the boy's entrance there would be the beginning of their downfall. After a while, the boys entered the house of gloom. Immediately, lighted sticks of fat pine were given to them, and the messengers of Hunkame also took a cigar to each one. These are their pine sticks, said the lord. They must return them at dawn tomorrow, together with the cigars, and you must bring them back whole, said the lord. So said the messengers when they arrived. Very well, the boys replied but they really did not light the sticks of pine. Instead, they put a red-colored thing in place of them, or some feathers from the tail of the macaw, which looked like lighted pine sticks to the night watchers, and as for the cigars, they attached fireflies to their ends. Night all night everybody thought they were defeated. They are lost, said the night watchman, but the pine sticks had not been burned and looked the same, and the cigars had not been lit and looked the same as before. They went to tell the lords, for how is this? Whence have they come? Who conceived them? Who gave birth to them? This really troubles us because it is not what they do. Their faces are strange, and strange is their conduct, they said to each other. Soon all the lords summoned the boys. Hey, let us play ball, boys, they said. Hunkame and Vukubkame both questioned them at the same time. Where did you come from? Tell us, boys, said the lords of Shibalba. Who knows whence we came? We do not know, they said, and nothing more. Very well. Let us play ball, boys, said the lords of Jibalba.
Good, they replied. We shall use our ball, said the lords of Sibalba. By no means shall you use your ball but ours, the boys answered. Not that one, but ours we shall use, insisted the lords of Sibalba. Very well, said the boys. Let us play for a worm, the chill, said the lords of Sibalba. No, but instead the head of the puma shall speak, said the boys. Not that, said Sibalba. Very well, said Hunapu. Then the lords of Jibalba seized the ball. They threw it directly at the ring of Hunapu. Immediately, while those of Shibalba grasped the handle of the knife of flint, the ball rebounded and bounced all around the floor of the ball court. "'What is this?' exclaimed Hunapu and Xbalanke. "'You wish to kill us. Perchance you did not send to call us, and your own messengers did not come. In truth, we are unfortunate. We shall leave at once.' the boys said to them. This was exactly what those of Shibalba wanted to happen to the boys. They would die immediately, right there in the ball court, and thus they would be overcome. But this did not occur, and the boys defeated the lords of Shibalba. Do not leave, boys. Let us go on playing ball, but we shall use your ball, they said to the boys. Very well, the boys answered, and then they drove their ball through the ring of Shibalba, and with this the game ended. And offended by their defeat, the men of Shibalba immediately said, What shall we do in order to overcome them? And turning to the boys, they said to them, Go gather and bring us, early tomorrow morning, four gourds of flowers. So said the men of Shibalba to the boys. Very well, and what kind of flowers? they asked the men of Shibalba. A branch of red chiptlene, a branch of white chiptlene, a branch of yellow chiptlene, and a branch of karinimak, said the men of Shibalba. Very well, replied the boys. Thus the talk ended. Equally strong and vigorous were the words of the boys, and their hearts were calm when they gave themselves up to be overcome. The lords of Shibalba were happy, thinking that they had already defeated them. This has turned out well for us. First, they must cut them the flowers, said the lords of Shibalba. Where shall they go to get the flowers? They said to themselves. Surely you will give us our flowers tomorrow early. Go then to cut them, the lords of Shibalba said to Hunapu and Ixbalanke. Very well, they replied. At dawn we shall play ball again, they said upon leaving. Immediately the boys entered the House of Knives, the second place of torture in Zibalba, and what the lords wanted was that they would be cut to pieces by the knives and would be quickly killed. That is what they wanted in their hearts. But the boys did not die. They spoke at once to the knives and said to them, Yours shall be the flesh of all the animals, they said to the knives. And they did not move again, but all the knives were quiet. Thus they passed the night in the house of knives, and calling all the ants, they said to them, Come, cutting ants, come, zompopos, and all of you go at once. Go and bring all the kinds of flowers that we must cut for the lords. Very well, they said, and all the ants went to bring the flowers from the gardens of Hun Kame and Vukub Kame. Previously, the lords had warned the guards of the flowers of Shibalba, Take care of our flowers. Do not let them be taken by the boys who shall come to cut them. But how could the boys see and cut the flowers? Not at all. Watch then, all night. Very well, they answered, but the guards in the garden heard nothing. Needlessly, they shouted up into the branches of the trees in the garden. There they were, all night, repeating their same shouts and songs. Ixpapuvek, Ixpapuvek, one shouted, Puhuyu, Puhuyu, the other answered. Puhuyu was the name of the two who watched the garden of Hunkame and Vukubkame. But they did not notice the ants, who were robbing them of what they were guarding, turning around and moving here and there, cutting the flowers, climbing the trees to cut the flowers, and gathering them from the ground at the foot of the trees. Meanwhile, the guards went on crying, and they did not feel the teeth that were cutting their tails and their wings.
and thus the ants carried between their teeth the flowers that they took down, and gathering them from the ground, they went on carrying them with their teeth. Quickly they filled the four gourds with flowers, which were moist with dew. When it dawned, immediately the messengers arrived to get them. Tell them to come, the Lord has said, and bring here instantly what they have cut, they said to the boys. Very well, the boys answered. Carrying the flowers in the four gourds they went, and when they arrived before the Lord of Jibalba and the other lords, it was lovely to see the flowers they had brought. In this way, the lords of Shibalba were overcome. The boys had only sent the ants to cut the flowers, and at night the ants cut them and put them in the gourds. Instantly the lords of Shibalba paled, and their faces became livid because of the flowers. They sent them to the guardians of the flowers at once. Why did you permit them to steal our flowers? These which we see here are our flowers, they said to the guardians. We notice nothing, my lord. Our tails also suffered, they answered. And then the lords tore at their mouths as a punishment for having let that which was under their care be stolen. Hunap and Exbalanke thus defeated Hunkame and Vukubkame, and this was the beginning of their deeds. Since that time, the mouth of the owl has been divided, cleft as it is today. Immediately they went down to play ball, and they also played several tie matches. Then they finished playing and agreed to play again at dawn the following day. So said the lords of Jibalba. It is well, said the boys upon finishing. Afterwards they entered the house of cold. It is impossible to describe how cold it was. The house was full of hail. It was a mansion of cold. Soon, however, the cold ended, because, with a fire of old logs, the boys made the cold disappear. That is why they did not die. They were still alive when it dawned. Surely what the lords of Shibalba wanted was for them to die, but it was not thus, and when it dawned they were still full of health, and they went out again when the messengers came to get them. How is this? They are not dead yet, said the lords of Zibalba. They were amazed to see the deeds of Hunapu and Xbalanke. Presently the boys entered the house of jaguars. The house was full of jaguars. Do not bite us! Here is what belongs to you, the boys said to the jaguars, and quickly they threw some bones to the animals which pounced upon the bones. Now surely they are finished. Already they have eaten their own entrails. At last they have given themselves up. Now their bones have been broken, said the guards, all happy because of this. But the boys did not die. As usual, well and healthy, they came out of the house of jaguars. What kind of people are they? Where did they come from? said all the lords of Shibalba. Presently the boys entered into the midst of the fire in the house of fire, inside which there was only fire, but they were not burned. Only the coals and the wood burned, and as usual, they were well when it dawned, but what the lords of Shibalba wished was that the boys would die rapidly where they had been. Nevertheless it did not happen thus, which disheartened the lords of Shibalba, then they put them in the house of bats. There was nothing but bats inside this house, the house of Kamazots, a large animal whose weapons for killing were like a dry point, and instantly those who came into their presence perished. The boys were in there then, but they slept inside their blowguns. Additionally, none of those who were inside the house bit them. Nevertheless, one of them had to give up because of another Kamazots that came from the sky and made him come into sight. The bats were assembled in council all night and flew about. Quilitz, Quilitz, they said. So they were saying it all night. They stopped for a little while, however, and they did not move, and were pressed against the end of one of the blowguns. Then Xbalanke said to Hunap, Look, you has it begun already to get light. Maybe so. I'm going to see Hunapu and Srid and as he wished very much to look out of the mouth of the blowgun and wished to see if it had dawned, instantly Kamazots cut off his head, and the body of Hunapu was decapitated. 
ex Balanque asked again, has it not yet dawned? But Hunapu did not move. Where have you gone, Hunapu? What have you done? But he did not move and remained silent. Then ex Balanque felt concerned and exclaimed, unfortunate are we, we are completely undone. They went immediately to hang the head of Hunapu in the bull court by special order of Hun Kame and Vukub Kame, and all the people of Shibalba rejoiced for what had happened to the head of Hunapu. Immediately, Ixbalanke called all the animals, the Kowati, the wild boar, all the animals small and large, during the night, and at dawn he asked them what their food was. What does each of you eat? I have called you so that you may choose your food, said Exbalanque to them. Very well, they answered, and immediately each went to take his own food, and they all went together. Some went to take rotten things, others went to take grass, others went to get stones, others went to gather earth. Varied was the food of the small animals and of the large animals. Behind them, the turtle was lingering. It came waddling along to take its food and reaching the end of Hunapu's body, it assumed the form of the head of Hunapu, and instantly the eyes were fashioned. Many soothsayers came then from heaven. The heart of heaven, Hurakan, came to soar over the house of bats. It was not easy to finish making the face, but it turned out very well. The hair had a handsome appearance, and the head could also speak. But as it was about to dawn, and the horizon reddened, Make it dark again, old one, the buzzard was told. Very well, said the old one, and instantly the old one darkened the sky. Now the buzzard has darkened it, people say nowadays. And so during the cool of dawn, the Hunapu began his existence. Will it be good, they said. Will it turn out to look like Hunapu? It is very good, they answered and really it seemed that the skull had changed itself back into a real head. Then the two boys talked among themselves and agreed, Do not play ball, only pretend to play. I shall do everything alone, said Ixbalanque. At once he gave a rabbit his orders. Go and take your place over the ball court. Stay there within the oak grove. When the ball comes to you, run out immediately, and I shall do the rest, they told the rabbit during the night. Presently day broke, and the two boys were well. Then they went down to play ball. The head of Hunapu was suspended over the ball court. We have triumphed, said the lords of Shibalba. You worked your own destruction. You have delivered yourselves, they said. In this way, they annoyed Hunapu. Hit his head with the ball, they said but they did not bother him with it. He paid no attention to it. Then the lords of Sibalba threw out the ball. Exbalanque went out to get it. The ball was going straight to the ring, but it stopped, bounced, and passed quickly over the ball court and, with a jump, went towards the oak grove. Instantly the rabbit ran out and went hopping, and the lords of Sibalba ran after it. They went, making noise and shouting after the rabbit. It ended with all of the lords of Shibalba going. At once, Ixbalanque took possession of the head of Hunapu, and taking the turtle, he went to suspend it over the ball court. And that head was actually the head of Hunapu, and the two boys were very happy. Those of Shibalba ran then to find the ball, and having found it between the oaks, called them, saying, Come here, here is the ball, we found it, they said, and they brought it. When the lord of Shibalba returned, they exclaimed, What is this we see? Then they began to play again. Both of them were tied. Presently, Exbalanque threw a stone at the turtle, which came to the ground and fell in the ball court, breaking into a thousand pieces like seeds before the lords. Who of you shall go to find it? Where is the one who shall go to bring it? said the lords of Shibalba. And so were the lords of Shibalba, overcome by Hunapu and Ixbalanque. These two suffered great hardships, but they did not die despite all that was done to them. Here is the account of the deaths of Hunapu and Exbalanque. Now, we shall tell of the way they died. Having been forewarned of all the suffering that the lords of Shibalba wished to impose upon them, they did not die of the tortures of Shibalba, 
nor were they overcome by all the fierce animals that were in Shibalba. Afterwards, they sent for two soothsayers who were like prophets. They were called Shul and Pakam, and were diviners. And they said unto them, The lords of Shibalba will question you regarding our deaths, for which they are planning and preparing due to the fact that we have not passed away, been victorious over them, succumb to their tortures, or been the target of animal attacks. We have the presentiment in our hearts that they will kill us by burning us. All the people of Zibalba have assembled, but the truth is that we shall not die. Here, then, you have our instructions as to what you must say. If, if they should come to consult you about our death, and that we may be sacrificed, what shall you say then, Zulu and Pakam? If they, a you, u, will it not be good to throw their bones into the ravine? No, it would not be well, tell them, because they would be brought to Liaginin afterward. If they are you, u, would it not be good to hang them from the trees? You shansa, er, uh, by no means would it be well because then you shall see their faces again. Oh, when hen for the thit time I'm they are you, oh. Would it be good to throw their bones into the river? If you were asked all the above by them, you should answer, it would be well if they were to die that way. Then it would be well to crush their bones on a grinding stone as cornmeal is ground. Let each one be grow separately. Throw them into the river immediately, where the spring gushes forth, in order that they may be carried away among all the small and large hills. Thus you shall answer them when the plan which we have advised you is put into practice, said Hunapu and Exbalanke. And when they the boys took leave of them, they already knew about their approaching deaths. They made then a great bonfire, a kind of oven. The men of Zibalba made it and filled it with thick branches. Shortly afterwards, the messengers who had to accompany the boys, the messengers of Hun Kame and Vukub Kame, arrived. Tell them to come, go and get the boys, go there so that they may know we are going to burn them. The Lord said, Oh, boys, the messengers exclaimed, it is well, they answered. And setting out quickly, they arrived near the bonfire. There, the lords of Shibalba wanted to force the boys to play a mock game with them. Let us drink our chicha and fly four times, each one over the bonfire, boys, was said to them. Do not try to deceive us, the boys answered. Perchance we do not know about our deaths, O lords, and that this is what awaits us here. And embracing each other face to face, they both stretched out their arms, bent towards the ground, and jumped into the bonfire, and thus the two died together. All those of Shibalba were filled with joy, shouting and whistling. They exclaimed, Now we have overcome them. At last they have given themselves up. Immediately they called Sulu and Pakam, to whom the boys had given their instructions, and asked them what they must do with their bones, as the boys had foretold. Those of Shibalba then ground their bones and went to cast them into the river. But the bones did not go very far. After settling themselves down at once on the bottom of the river, they were changed back into handsome boys, and when they showed themselves again, they really had the same old faces. The people saw them again on the fifth day in the water. Both had the appearance of fishermen when those of Shibalba saw them after having hunted them all over the river. And the following day, two poor men presented themselves with very old-looking faces, miserable appearances and ragged clothes, whose countenances did not commend them. So they were seen by all those in Shibalba, and what they did was very little. They only performed the dances of the Puhui Owl, the Crux Weasel, and the Eboy Armadillo. They also danced the Kstzul Centipede and the Kittik that walks on stilts. Furthermore, they worked many miracles. They burned houses as though they really were burning, and instantly they were as they had been before. Many of those in Shibalba watched them in wonder. 
Presently they cut themselves into bits. They killed each other. The first one whom they had killed stretched out as though he were dead, and instantly the other brought him back to life. Those of Shibalba looked on in amazement at all they did, and they performed it as the beginning of their triumph over those of Shibalba. Presently word of their dances came to the ears of the lords Hun Kame and Vukub Kame. Upon hearing it, they exclaimed, Who are these two orphans? Do they really give you so much pleasure? Surely their dances are very beautiful, and all that they do, answered he who had brought the news to the lords. Happy to hear this, the lords then sent their messengers to call the boys with flattery. Tell them to come here, tell them to come, so that we may see what they do, that we may admire them and regard them with wonder, the Lord said, so you shall say unto them. This was told to the messengers. They arrived at once before the dancers and gave them the message of the Lord's. We do not wish to, the boys answered, because frankly we are ashamed. How could we not but be ashamed to appear in the house of the lords with our ugly countenances, our eyes which are so big, and our poor appearance? Do you not see that we are nothing more than some poor dancers? What shall we tell our companions in poverty who have come with us and wish to see our dances and be entertained by them? How could we do our dances before the lords? For that reason, then, we do not want to go, O oh, messengers, said Hunapu and Expalonke. Finally, with downcast faces and with reluctance and sorrow, they went. But for a while they did not wish to walk, and the messengers had to beat them in the face many times when they led them to the house of the lords. They arrived then, before the lords, timid and with head bowed, they came prostrating themselves, making reverences and humiliating themselves. They looked feeble and ragged, and their appearance was really that of vagabonds. When they arrived, they were questioned immediately about their country and their people. They also asked them about their mother and their father. "'Where do you come from?' the Lord said. "'We do not know, sir. We do not know the faces of our mother and father. We were small when they died,' they answered, and did not say another word. "'All right. Now do your dances so that we may admire you. What do you want? We shall give you pay, they told them. We do not want anything, but really we are very much afraid, they said to the Lord. Do not grieve, do not be afraid. Dance, and do first the part in which you kill yourselves. Burn my house, do all that you know how to do. We shall marvel at you, for that is what our hearts desire. And afterwards, poor things, we shall give help for your journey, they told them. Then they began to sing and dance. All the people of Jibalba arrived and gathered together in order to see them. Then they performed the dance of the crux. They danced the pushy, and they danced the boy. And the Lord said to them, Cut my dog into pieces and let him be brought back to life by you, he said to them. Very well, they answered, and cut the dog into bits. Instantly they brought him back to life. The dog was truly full of joy when he was brought back to life and wagged his tail when they revived him. The Lord said to them then, Burn my house now. Thus, he said to them, instantly they put fire to the Lord's house, and although all the lords were assembled together within the house, they were not burned. Quickly it was whole again, and not for one instant was the house of Hunkame destroyed. All of the lords were amazed, and in the same way the boys' dances gave them much pleasure. Then they were told by the Lord, Now kill a man, sacrifice him, but do not let him die, he told them. Very well, they answered, and seizing a man, they quickly sacrificed him, and raising his heart on high, they held it so that all the lords could see it. Again, Hunkame and Vukubkame were amazed. A moment afterwards, the man was brought back to life by the boys, and his heart was filled with joy when he was revived. The lords were astounded. Sacrifice yourselves now. Let us see it. We really like your dances, said the lords. Very well, sirs, they answered, and they proceeded to sacrifice each other. Hunapu 
was sacrificed by Exbalanque. One by one, his arms and his legs were sliced off. His head was cut from his body and carried away. His heart was torn from his breast and thrown onto the grass. All the lords of Shibalba were fascinated. They looked on in wonder, but really it was only the dance of one man. It was Exbalanque. Get up, he said, and instantly Hunapu returned to life. The boys were very happy, and the lords were also happy. In truth, what they did gladdened the hearts of Hunkame and Vukubkame, and the latter felt as though they were dancing. Then their hearts were filled with desire and longing by the dances of Hunapu and Exbalanque, and Hunkame and Vukubkame gave their commands. Do the same with us, sacrifice us, they said, cut us into pieces one by one. Hunkame and Vukubkame said to Hunapu and Spalanke, Very well, afterwards, you will come back to life again. Perchance, did you not bring us here in order that we should entertain you, the lords and your sons and vassals? They said to the lords. And so it happened that they first sacrificed the one who was the chief and lord of Shibalba, the one called Hunkame, king of Shibalba. And when Hunkame was dead, they overpowered Vukubkame, and they did not bring either of them back to life. The people of Shibalba fled as soon as they saw that their lords were dead and sacrificed. In an instant, both were sacrificed, and this they, the boys, did in order to chastise them. Quickly, the principal lord was killed, and they did not bring him back to life. And another lord humbled himself then and presented himself before the dancers. They had not discovered him, nor had they found him. Have mercy on me, he said when they found him. All the sons and vassals of Jibalba fled to a great ravine, and all of them were crowded into this narrow, deep place. There they were crowded together, and hordes of ants came and found them and dislodged them from the ravine. In this way the ants drove them to the road, and when they arrived the people prostrated themselves and gave themselves up. They humbled themselves and arrived grieving. In this way the lords of Shibalba were overcome. Only by a miracle and by their own transformation could the boys have done it. Immediately the boys told their names, and they extolled themselves before all the people of Zibalba. Hear our names. We shall also tell you the names of our fathers. We are Hunapu and Isbalanke. Those are our names, and our fathers are those whom you killed, and who were called Hun Hunapu and Vukub Hunapu. We, those whom you see here, are, then, the avengers of the torments and suffering of our fathers. That is the reason why we resent all the evil you have done to them. Therefore, we shall put an end to all of you, we shall kill you, and not one of you shall escape, they said. Instantly, all the people of Shibalba fell to their knees, crying, Have mercy on us, Hunapu and Ixbalanke. It is true that we sinned against your fathers, as you said, and that they are buried in Puchbalcha, they said. Very well, this is the sentence that we are going to tell you. Hear it, all you of Shibalba. Since neither your great power nor your race any longer exist, and since neither do you deserve mercy, your rank shall be lowered. Not for you shall be the ball game. You shall spend your time making earthen pots and tubs and stones to grind corn. Only the children of the thickets and desert shall speak with you, the noble sons, the civilized vassals shall not consort with you, and they will forsake your presence. The sinners, the evil ones, the sad ones, the unfortunate ones, those who give themselves up to vice, these are the ones who will welcome you. No longer will you seize men suddenly for sacrifice. Remember, your rank has been lowered. Thus they spoke to all the people of Shibalba, in this way, their destruction and their lamentations began. Their power in the olden days was a little. They only liked to do evil to men in those times. In truth, in those days, they did not have the category of gods. 
Furthermore, their horrible faces frightened people. They were the enemies, the ouls. They incited to evil, to sin, and to discord. They were also false in their hearts, black and white at the same time, envious and tyrannical, according to what was said of them. Furthermore, they painted and greased their faces. In this way, then, occurred the loss of their grandeur and the decadence of their empire. And this was what Hunapu and Exbalanke did. Meanwhile, the grandmother was crying and lamenting before the reeds which they had left planted. The reeds sprouted, then they dried up when the boys were consumed in the bonfire. Afterwards, the reeds sprouted again. Then the grandmother lighted the fire and burned incense before the reeds in memory of her grandchildren, and the grandmother's heart filled with joy when for the second time the reeds sprouted. Then they were worshipped by the grandmother, and she called them the center of the house, Nika the center they were called. Green reeds growing in the plains, Kazama Chatam Ulu was their name, they were called the center of the house, and the center because they planted the reeds in the middle of the house, and the reeds which were planted were called the plains, green reeds growing on the plains. They were also called green reeds because they had been rerouted. This name was given to them by Ixmukane, given to those reeds which Hunapu and Ixbalanke left planted, in order that they should be remembered by their grandmother. Well, now their fathers, those who died long ago, were Hunhunapu and Vukub Hunapu. They also saw the faces of their fathers there in Shibalba, and their fathers talked with their descendants, that is, the ones who overthrew those of Shibalba. And here is how their fathers were honored by them. They honored Vukub Hunapu. They went to honor him at the place of sacrifice of the ball court. And at the same time, they wanted to make Vukub Hunahpu's face. They hunted there for his entire body, his mouth, his nose, his eyes. They found his body, but it could do very little. It could not pronounce his name, this Hunahpu. Neither could his mouth say it. And here is how they extolled the memory of their fathers, whom they had left there in the place of sacrifice at the ball court. You shall be invoked. Their son said to them when they fortified their hearts, You shall be the first to arise, and you shall be the first to be worshipped by the sons of the noblemen, by the civilized vassals. Your names shall not be lost, so it shall be. They told their fathers, and thus consoled themselves, We are the avengers of your death, of the pains and sorrows which they caused you. Thus was their leave-taking when they had already overcome all the people of Zibalba. Then they rose up in the midst of the light, and instantly they were lifted into the sky. One was given the sun, the other the moon. Then the arch of heaven and the face of the earth were lighted, and they dwelt in heaven. Then the four hundred boys whom Zipakna had killed also ascended. And so they again became the companions of the boys, and were changed into stars in the sky. Part 3 Here then is the beginning of when it was decided to make man, and when what must enter into the flesh of man was sought. And the forefathers, the creators and makers, who were called Tepo and Gukumats, said, The time of dawn has come, let the work be finished and let those who are to nourish and sustain us appear, the noble sons, the civilized vassals, let man appear humanity on the face of the earth. Thus they spoke, they assembled, came together, and held a council in the darkness and at night. Then they sought and discussed, and here they reflected and thought. In this way their decisions came dearly to light, and they found and discovered what must enter into the flesh of man. It was just before the sun, the moon, and the stars appeared over the creators and makers. From Paxil, or Kayala as they were called, came the yellow ears of corn and the white ears of corn. Yeah. These are the names of the animals that brought the food. Yak, the mountain cat, Ute, the coyote, Quell, a small parrot, and Ho, the crow. 
These four animals gave tidings of the yellow ears of corn and the white ears of corn. They told them that they should go to Paxil, and they showed them the road to Paxil. And thus they found the food, and this was what went into the flesh of the created man, the made man. This was his blood, of this the blood of man was made. So the corn entered into the formation of man by the work of the forefathers. And in this way they were filled with joy, because they had found a beautiful land, full of pleasures, abundant in ears of yellow corn and ears of white corn, and abundant also in pataxte and cacao, and in innumerable zapotes, anonas, jocotes, nancies, matasanos, and honey. There was an abundance of delicious food in those villages, called Paxil and Kayala. There were foods of every kind, small and large foods, small plants and large plants. The animals showed them the road. Then grinding the yellow corn and the white corn, Shmukane made nine drinks, and from this food came strength and flesh, and with it they created the muscles and the strength of man. This is what the forefathers did, Tepu and Guchumats, as they were called. After that they began to talk about the creation and the making of our first mother and father. Of yellow corn and of white corn they made their flesh. Of cornmeal dough they made the arms and legs of man. Only the dow of cornmeal went into the flesh of our first fathers, the four men who were created. These are the names of the first men who were created and formed. The first man was Balam Kitse, the second was Balam Akab, the third was Mahukuta, and the fourth was Iki Balam. These are the names of our first mothers and fathers. It is said that they were only made and formed. They had no mother, and they had no father. They were only called men. They were not born of women, nor were they begotten by the Creator, by the Maker, or by the forefathers, only by a miracle, by means of incantation, were they created and made by the Creator, the Maker, the forefathers, Tapu and Guchumats. And as they had the appearance of men, they were men. They talked, conversed, saw and heard, walked and grasped things. They were good and handsome men, and their figure was the figure of a man. They were endowed with intelligence. They saw, and instantly they could see far. They succeeded in seeing. They succeeded in knowing all that there is in the world. When they looked, instantly they saw all around them, and they contemplated in turn the arch of heaven and the round face of the earth. The things hidden in the distance they saw all without first having to move. At once they saw the world. And so, too, from where they were, they saw it. Great was their wisdom. Their sight reached the forests, the rocks, the lakes, the seas, the mountains, and the valleys. In truth, they were admirable men, Balamkitse, Balamakab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam. Then the Creator and the Maker asked them, What do you think of your condition? Do you not see? Do you hear? Need to improve your speech and manner of walking? Look, then! Consider the world, and look and see if the mountains and the valleys appear. Try then to see, they said to the four first men. And immediately the four first men began to see all that was in the world. Then they gave thanks to the Creator and the Maker. We really give you thanks two and three times. We have been created. We have been given a mouth and a face. We speak, we hear, we think, and we walk. We feel perfectly, and we know what is far and what is near. We also see the large and the small in the sky and on earth. We give you thanks then for having created us, O Creator and Maker, for having given us being, O our Grandmother, O our Grandfather. They said, giving thanks for their creation and formation. They were able to know all, and they examined the four comers, the four points of the arch of the sky, and the round face of the earth. But the Creator and the Maker did not hear this with pleasure. It is not well what our creatures and our works say. They know all, the large and the small, they said. And so the forefathers held counsel again. What shall we do with them now? Let their sight reach only to that which is near. Let them see only a little of the face of the earth. 
It is not what they say. Perchance are they not by nature simple creatures of our making. Must they also be gods? And if they do not reproduce and multiply, when will it dawn when the sun rises? And what if they do not multiply? So they spoke. Let us check a little on their desires, because it is not well what we see. Must they perchance be the equals of ourselves, their makers, who can see afar, who know all and see all? Thus spoke the heart of heaven, Hurakan, Chipikakulha, Raksakakulha, Tepeu, Gukumats, the forefathers, Expiakok, Exmukane, the creator, and the maker. Thus they spoke, and immediately they changed the nature of their works and of their creatures. Then the heart of heaven blew mist into their eyes, which clouded their sight as when a mirror was breathed upon. Their eyes were covered, and they could see only what was close, only that which was clear to them. In this way, the wisdom and all the knowledge of the four men, the origin and beginning of the Quiche race, were destroyed. In this way, we were created and formed by our grandfathers, our fathers, by the heart of heaven and the heart of earth. Then their wives had to be and their women were made. God himself made them carefully. And so, during sleep, they came truly beautiful, their women, at the side of Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam. There were their women when they awakened, and instantly their hearts were filled with joy because of their wives. Here are the names of their wives. Kaha Paluna was the name of the wife of Balam Kitze. Chomiha was the wife of Balam Akab. Tzununiha was the wife of Maukuta, and Kakisaha was the name of the wife of Ikibalam. These are the names of their wives, who were distinguished women. They conceived the men of the small tribes and of the large tribes, and were the origin of us, the people of Kishé. There were many priests and sacrifices. There were not only four, but those four were the forefathers of us, the people of the Kishé. The names of each one were different when they multiplied there in the east, and there were many names of the people, Tepeu, Oloman, Koha, Quenech, Ahau, as they called those men there in the east where they multiplied. The beginning is known too, of those of Tamub and those of Ilokab, who came together from there in the east. Balam Kitze was the grandfather and father of the nine great houses of the Kavik, Balamakab was the grandfather and father of the nine great houses of the Nimhaib. Mahukuta was the grandfather and father of the four great houses of Ahau Kishé. Three groups of families existed, but they still remembered the names of their grandfather and father, those who propagated and multiplied there in the east. The Tamub and Ilokab also came, and thirteen branches of peoples, the thirteen of Tekpan, and those of Rabinal, the Kachikwel, those from Tsikwinaha, and the Zakaha, and the Lamak, Kumats, Tuhalha, Uchabaha, those of Chumilaha, those of Quibaha, of Batenaba, Akulvinak, Balamiha, the Kanchahel, and Balamkolob. These are only the principal tribes, the branches of the people which we mention, only of the principal ones shall we speak. Many others came from each group of people, but we shall not write their names. They also multiplied there in the east. Many men were made, and in the darkness they multiplied. Neither the sun nor the light had yet been made when they multiplied. All lived together. They existed in great numbers and walked there in the east. Nevertheless, they did not sustain nor maintain their god. They only raised their faces to the sky, and they did not know why they had come so far as they did. There were then, in great number, the black men and the white men, men of many classes and men of many tongues, and it was wonderful to hear them. There are generations in the world, there are country people whose faces we do not see and who have no homes. They only wander through the small and large woodlands like crazy people. So it is said scornfully of the people of the wood, so they said there, where they saw the rising of the sun. The speech of all was the same. They did not invoke wood or stone, and they remembered the words of the Creator and the Maker, 
the heart of heaven and the heart of earth. And in this manner they spoke while they thought about the coming of dawn. And they raised their prayers, those worshippers of the word of God, loving and obedient, and fearful, raising their faces to the sky when they asked for daughters and sons. O thou Zakel Bitol, look at us, hear us, do not leave us, do not forsake us. O God, who art in heaven and on earth, heart of heaven, heart of earth, give us our descendants, our succession, as long as the sun shall move and there shall be light. Let it dawn, let the day come, give us many good flat roads. May the people have peace, much peace, and may they be happy and give us a good life and useful extents. O oh, thou hurakan, chipi kakulha, raksa kakulha, chipi nanawak, raksa nanawak, vok, hunapu, tepeu, guchumats, alom, kaholom, expiakok, ksmukane, grandmother of the sun, grandmother of the light, let there be dawn and let the light come. Thus they spoke while they saw and invoked the coming of the sun, the arrival of the day, and at the same time that they saw the rising of the sun, they contemplated the morning star, the great star, which comes ahead of the sun and lights up the arch of the sky and the surface of the earth and illuminates the steps of the men who had been created and made. Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta and Iquibalam said, Let us await the break of day. So said those great wise men, the enlightened men, the priests, and the sacrificers. This, they said, our first mothers and fathers did not yet have wood or stones to keep, but their hearts were tired of waiting for the sun. Already all the tribes and the Yaki people, the priests and sacrificers, were very many. Let us go, let us go to search and see if our tribal symbols are in safety, if we can find what we must burn before them. For being as we are, there is no one who watches for us, said Balam Kitze, Balamakab, Mahuchuta, and Iki Balam, and having heard of a city, they went there. Now then, the name of the place where Balam Kitze, Balamakab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam, and those of Tamub and Ilokab went, was Tulan Zuiva, Vukub Pek, and Vukub Zivan. This was the name of the city where they went to receive their gods. So then all arrived at Tulan. It was impossible to count the men who arrived. There were very many, and they walked in an orderly way. Then was the appearance of their gods, first those of Balam Kitze, Balamakab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam, who were filled with joy. At last we have found that for which we searched, they said. The first to appear was Tohil, as this god was called and Balam Kitze put him on his back, in his chest. Instantly the god called Avilix appeared, and Balamakab carried him. The god called Hakavitz was carried by Mahukuta, and Ikibalam carried the one called Nikataka, and together with the people of the Kishé they also received those of Tamub. In the same way, Tohil was the name of the god of the Tamub, who received the grandfather and father of the lords of Tamub, whom we know today. In third place were those of Ilokab, the god who the grandfathers and fathers of the lords received was also known by the name of Tohil. In this way the three Kishé families were given their names, and they did not separate because they had a god of the same name, Tohil of the Kishé, Tohil of the Tamub, and Tohil of the Ilokab. One only was the name of the god, and therefore the three Kishé families did not separate. Indeed, great was the virtue of the three, Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. Then all the people arrived, those from Rabinal, the Kakchikel, those from Tsikinaha, and the people who now are called the Yaki. And there it was that the speech of the tribes changed, their tongues became different, they could no longer understand each other clearly after arriving at Tulan. They also separated. Some had to go to the east, but many came here. Their clothing was only the skins of animals. They had no good clothes to put on, and the skins of animals were their only dress. They were poor, they possessed nothing, but they had the nature of extraordinary men. 
When they arrived at Tulanzuiva, Vukupek, and Vukubzivan, the old traditions say that they had travelled far in order to arrive there, and they did not have fire, only the people of Tohil had it. He was the god of the tribes that first created fire. It is not known how it was made, because it was already burning when Balam Quitze and Balam Akab saw it. Ah, we have no fire yet, we shall die of cold, they said. Then Tohil said to them, Do not worry, yours shall be the lost fire that is talked of. Yours shall be what is spoken of as lost fire, Tohil said to them. Really, O oh God, our support, our maintenance, thou our God, they said, returning thanks. And Tohil answered, Very well, certainly I am your God, so shall it be. I am your Lord, so let it be. Tohil thus explained it to the priests and sacrificers, and in this manner the tribes received fire, and they were joyful because of it. Instantly a great shower began to fall when the fire of the tribes was burning. Much hail fell on all the tribes, and the fire was put out because of it, and again the fire was extinguished. Then Balam Kitze and Balam Akab again asked Tohil for fire. Oh, Tohil, we are truly dying of cold, they said to Tohil. Very well, do not worry, Tohil answered, and instantly he made fire, turning about in his shoe. Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta and Ikibalam were happy at once, and they immediately became warm. Now the fire of the people of Vukamag had also gone out, and they were dying of cold. Immediately they came to ask Balankitze, Balamakab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam for fire. They could no longer bear the cold nor the ice. They were shivering and their teeth were chattering. They were numb, their legs and hands shook, and they could not hold anything in them when they came. We are not ashamed to come before you, to beg for a little of your fire, they said, but they needed to be better received. And then the tribers were very sad. The speech of Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam is different. Oh, we have given up our speech. What have we done? We are lost. How were we deceived? We had only one speech when we arrived there at Tulan. We were created and educated in the same way. It is not good what we have done, said all the tribes under the trees, under the vines. Then a man came before Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam, and this man, who was a messenger of Shibalba, spoke thus, This is in truth your God, this is your support, this is furthermore the representation, the memory of your Creator and Maker. Do not give your fire to the tribes. Until they present offerings to Tohil, it is not necessary that they give anything to you. Ask Tohil what they should give when they come to receive fire, said the man from Shibalba. He had wings like the wings of a bat. I am sent by your Creator, your Maker, said the man of Shibalba. They were filled with joy then, and Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz were also gladdened when the man from Shibalba spoke, who disappeared instantly from their presence. But the tribes did not perish when they came, although they were dying of cold. There was much hail, black rain and mist, and an indescribable cold. All the tribes were trembling and shivering with cold when they came to where Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam were. Their hearts were greatly troubled, and their mouths and eyes were sad. In a moment the beggars came before Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam and said, Will you not have pity on us? We only ask a little of your fire. Perchance, were we not once together and reunited? Did we not have the same home and one country when we were created? Have mercy then on us, they said. What will you give us so that we shall have mercy on you? They were asked. Well then, we shall give you money, the tribes answered. We do not want money, said Balam Kitze and Balam Akab. And what do you want? asked the tribes. We shall ask now, said Balam Kitze. Very well, said the tribes. We shall ask Tohil, and then we shall tell you, they answered. What must the tribes give, O Tohil? 
Who has come to ask for your fire? said Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam. Well, are they willing to give their waists and their armpits? Do they want me to embrace them? For if they do not want to do that, neither shall I give them fire, answered Tuhil. Tell them that this shall come later, that they do not have to come now to give me their waist and their armpits. This is what Tohil orders us to tell you, you will say. This was the answer to Balam Kidze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam. Then they took Tohil's message. Very well, we shall join you, and we shall embrace him. The people said when they heard, and were told the message from Tohil and they did not delay in acting. Good, they said, but may it be soon, and immediately they received the fire. Then they became warm. There was, nevertheless, a tribe who stole the fire in the smoke, and they were from Zotzil's house. The god of the Kachikwel was called Shamal Khan, and he was in the form of a bat. When they passed through the smoke, they went softly and then they seized the fire. The Kachikel did not ask for the fire because they did not want to give themselves up to be overcome, the way that the other tribes had been overcome when they offered their breasts and their armpits so that they would be opened. And this was the opening of the breasts about which Tohil had spoken, that they should sacrifice all the tribes before him, that they should tear out their hearts from their breasts. When Tohil foretold the assuming of power and sovereignty by Balam Kidze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iqui Balam, this had not yet happened. There, in Tulan Zuiva, whence they had come, they were accustomed to fasting. They observed a perpetual fast while they awaited the coming of dawn and watched for the rising sun. They took turns, watching the great star called Ikokwi, which rises first before the sun when the sun rises, and the brilliant Ikokwi, which was always before them in the east, when they were there in the place called Tulan Zuiva, whence came their god. It was not here then where they received their power and sovereignty, but there they subdued and subjected the large and small tribes when they sacrificed them before Tohil and offered him the blood, substance, breasts, and sides of all the men. In Tulan the power came instantly to them. Great was their wisdom in the darkness and in the night. Then they came, pulled up stakes there, and left the east. This is not our home. Let us go and see where we should settle, Tohil said then. In truth, he was accustomed to talking to Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam. Give thanks before setting out. Do what is necessary to bleed your ears, prick your elbows, and make your sacrifices. This shall be your thanks to God. Very well, they said, taking blood from their ears, and they wept in their chants, because they departed from Tulan. Their hearts mourned when they left Tulan. Pity us, we shall not see the dawn here when the sun rises and lights the face of the earth, they said, as they left, but they left some people on the road, which they followed, so that they would keep watch. Each of the tribes kept getting up to see the star, which was the herald of the sun. This is the sign of the dawn they carried in their hearts when they came from the east, and with the same hope they left there from that great distance, according to what their songs now say. They came at last to the top of a mountain, and there all the Quiche people and the tribes were reunited. There they all held a council to make their plans. Today this mountain is called Pixab. This is the name of the mountain. There they reunited, and there they extolled themselves. I am... I, the people of the Quiche, and thou, Tamub, that shall be thy name. And to those from Ilokab they said, Thou, Ilokab, this shall be thy name, and these three Quiche peoples shall not disappear. Our fate is the same, they said when they gave them their names. Then they gave the Kachikel their name, Gagchekaleb was their name. In the same way they named those of Rabinul, which was their name, and they still have it, and also those of Zikinaha, as they are called today. Those are the names that they gave to each other. There they were, coming together to await dawn, and watching for the coming of the star, which comes just before the sun, when it is about to rise. We came from there, but we have separated, they said to each other. 
and their hearts were troubled. They were suffering greatly. They did not have food. They did not have sustenance. They only smelled the ends of their staffs, and thus they imagined they were eating, but they did not eat when they came. However, how they crossed the sea needs to be clarified. They crossed to this side as if there were no sea. They crossed on stones placed in a row over the sand. For this reason, they were called stones in a row and sand under the sea, names given to them when their tribes crossed the sea, the waters having parted when they passed, and their hearts were troubled when they talked together because they had nothing to eat, only a drink of water and a handful of corn. There they were then, assembled on the mountain called Chipiksab, and they had also brought Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. Balam Kitze and his wife Kaha Paluna, which was the name of his wife, observed a complete fast, and so did Balam Akab and his wife, who was called Chomiha, Mahuchuta and his wife, called Zununiha, also observed a complete fast, and Iqui Balam, with his wife, called Kakiksaha, likewise. And some fasted in the darkness and at night. Great was their sorrow when they were on the mountain called Shipiksab, and their gods spoke to them again. Thus Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz spoke to Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam. Let us go. Let us get up. Let us not stay here. Take us to a secret place. Already dawn draws near. Would it not be a disgrace for you if we were imprisoned by our enemies within these walls, where you, the priests and sacrificers, keep us? Put each of us, then, in a safe place, they said when they spoke. Very well, we shall go on, we shall go in search of the forests, all answered. Immediately after, they took up their gods and put them on their backs. In this manner, they transported Avilix to the ravine they named Uabal Zivan, a sizable ravine of the forest now known as Pavilix, and left him there. Balam Akab left him in this ravine. They were left one by one. The first one left was Hakavitz. He was left on a large red pyramid on the mountain now called Hakavitz. There they founded their town in the place where the god Hakavitz was. Mahukuta left his god, who was the second one they had hidden, in the same way. Hakavitz was not in the forest, but on a hill cleared of trees. Hakavitz was hidden. Then Balam Kitze came, and he came there to the large forest. Balam Kitze came to hide Tohil at the hill, which is today called Patohil. Then they celebrated the hiding of Tohil in the ravine, in his refuge. There were a lot of snakes, jaguars, vipers, and cantiles in the forest, where the priests and sacrifices had hidden them. Balam Kitse, Balim Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam were together. Together they awaited the dawn there on the mountain called Hakavitz. And a short distance away was the god of the people of Tamub and of the people of Ilokab. Amaktan is the place where the god of the Tamub people was, and their dawn came to the tribes. The place where those from Ilokab awaited the dawn was called Amak Ukrinkat. There was the god of those of Ilokab, a short distance from the mountain. There, too, were all the people of Rabinal, the Kakchikwel the Tsiki Naha, all the small tribes and the large tribes. Together they waited for the dawn and the rise of the large star called Ikokwih, which rises just before the sun when it dawns, according to legend. There they were together then, Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam. They did not sleep. They remained standing, and great was the anxiety of their hearts and their stomachs for the coming of dawn and the day. There, too, they felt shame. They were overcome with great sorrow and great suffering, and they were oppressed with pain. They had come that far. Oh, we have come without joy. If only we could see the rising of the sun. What shall we do now? If we lived in harmony in our country, why did we leave it? They said to each other, in the midst of their sadness and affliction, and with mournful voices. They talked, but they could not calm their hearts, which were anxious for the coming of dawn. The gods are seated in the ravines, in the forests. They are among the air plants, among the mosses. Not even a seat of boards were they given. 
they said. First there were Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavits. Great was their glory, their strength, and their power over the gods of all the tribes. Many were their miracles, countless journeys, and their pilgrimages in the midst of the cold, and the hearts of the tribes were filled with fear. But calm were the hearts of Balam Quitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam. With respect to them, the gods. They felt no anxiety in their hearts for the gods, whom they had received and had carried on their backs when they came there from Tulan Zuiva, from there in the east. They were there then in the forest, now called Zakwiribal, Patohil, Paavilix, and Pahakavits. And next came the dawn, and light shone on our grandparents and our parents. Now we shall tell of the coming of the dawn, and the appearance of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Here then is the dawn and the coming of the sun, the moon, and the stars. Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam were very happy when they saw the morning star. It rose first with a shining face when it came ahead of the sun. Immediately they unwrapped the incense that they had brought from the east and planned to burn, and then they untied the three gifts that they had planned to offer. The incense that Balam Kize brought was called Mixtan Pom, the incense that Balam Akab brought was called Kavikstan Pom, and the incense that Mahukuta brought was called Kabui Pom. The three had their incense burned when they began to dance, facing towards the east. They wept for joy as they danced and burned their incense, their precious incense. Then they wept because they had not yet beheld nor seen the sunrise. But then the sun came up. The small and large animals were happy and arose from the banks of the river, in the ravines, and on the tops of the mountains, and all turned their eyes to where the sun was rising. Then the puma and the jaguar roared. But first the bird called Kelets burst into song. In truth, all the animals were happy, and the eagle, the white vulture, the small birds, and the large birds stretched their wings. The priests and the sacrificers were kneeling. Great was the joy of the priests and sacrificers, and of the people of Tamub and Ilokab, and the people of Rabinal, the Kachikel, those from Zikinaha, and those from Tuhalha, Uchabaha, Quibaha, from Batana, and the Yaki Tepeu, all those tribes that exist today. And it was not possible to count the people. The light of dawn fell upon all the tribes at the same time. Instantly, the surface of the earth was dried by the sun. Like a man, the sun showed itself, and its face glowed when it dried the surface of the earth. Before the sun rose, the surface of the earth was damp and muddy before the sun came up. But then the sun rose and came up like a man, and the heat was unbearable. It showed itself when it was born, and remained fixed in the sky like a mirror. Certainly, it was not the same sun that we see, it is said in their old tales. Immediately afterwards, Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavits were turned to stone, together with the deified beings, the puma, the jaguar, the snake, the cantil, and the hobgoblin. Their arms became fastened to the trees when the sun, the moon, and the stars appeared. All alike were changed into stone. Because of the voracious animals, the puma, the jaguar, the snake, and the cantil, as well as the hobgoblin, perhaps we shouldn't be alive today. Perhaps our power wouldn't exist if the sun hadn't turned these first animals into stone. When the sun arose, the hearts of Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam were filled with joy. Great was their joy when it dawned, and there were not many men at that place. Only a few were there on the mountain Hakavits. Their dawn came to them. There they burned their incense and danced, turning their gaze towards the east, whence they had come. There were their mountains and their valleys, whence had come Balam Kitse. Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam, as they were called. But it was here where they multiplied on the mountain, and this was their town. 
Here they were too when the sun, the moon, and the stars appeared when it dawned, and the face of the earth and the whole world were lit. Here too began their song, which they call Kamuku. They sang it, but only the pain in their hearts and their innermost selves were expressed in their song. Oh, pity us! In Tulan we were lost, we were separated, and there our older and younger brothers stayed. Ah, we have seen the sun. But where are they now that it has dawned, said the priests and the sacrifices of the Yaki. In truth, the so-called Tohil is the same god as the Yaki, the one called Yolkuat Quetzalcoat. We became separated there in Tulan, in Zuiva. From there we went out together, and there our race was created when we came, they said to each other. Then they remembered their older brothers and their younger brothers, the Yaqui, to whom dawn came to the land that today is called Mexico. Some of the people remained there in the east, those called Tepeo Oliman, who stayed there, they say. They felt much grief in their hearts there in Hakavitz, and sad, too, were the people from Tamub and Ilokab, who were also there in the forest called Amaktan, where dawn came to the priests and sacrifices of Tamub, and to their god, who also was Tohil, because one and the same was the name of the god of the three branches of the Kishé people. And this is also the name of the god of the people of Rabinal, for there is little difference between that and the name of Hunto, as the god of the people of Rabinal is called. For that reason, it is said, they wanted to make their speech the same as that of the Kishé. Well, the speech of the Kachikal is different, because the name of their god was different when they came from there, from Tulan Zuiva. Zotzihachimalsan was the name of their god, and today they speak a different tongue, and also from their god the families of Apozotzil and Apoxa, as they are called, took their names. The speech of god was also changed when they were given their god there in Tulan near the stone. Their speech was changed when they came from Tulan in the darkness. Being together, Dawn came to them, and the light shone on all the tribes in the order of the names of the gods of each of the tribes, and now we shall tell of their stay and abode there on the mountain, where the four called Balam Kitse, Balamakab, Mahukuta, and Iqui Balam were together. Their hearts mourned for Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz, whom they had placed among the air plants and the moss. We shall tell now how they made the sacrifices at the foot of the place where they had carried Tohil when they arrived in the presence of Tohil and Avalix. They went to see them, to greet them, and also to give them thanks for dawn's arrival. They were in the thicket amidst the stones there in the woods, and only by magic did they speak when the priests and sacrifices came before Tohil. They did not bring great gifts, they only brought resin, the remains of the gum, called No and Pericon, which they burned before their gods. Then Tohil spoke. Only by a miracle did he give counsel to the priests and sacrifices, and the gods spoke and said, Truly, here shall be our mountains and our valleys. We are yours. Great shall be our Lord, and numerous our descendants through the work of all men. Yours are all the tribes, and we are your companions. Care for your town, and we shall give you your learning. Don't show us to the tribes when we are upset with what they say or how they act. Neither shall you permit us to fall into a snare. Give us instead the creatures of the woods and of the fields, as well as the female deer and the female birds. Come and give us a little of your blood. Have pity on us. You may have the skins of the deer and guard us against those whose eyes have deceived us. So then, the skin of the deer shall be our symbol, which you shall show before the tribes. When they ask, Where is Tohil? Show the deer skin before their eyes. Neither shall you show yourselves, for you shall have other things to do. Great shall be their position. You shall dominate all the tribes. You shall bring your blood and their substance before us, and those who come to embrace us shall be ours also. 
Thus spoke Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. They had the appearance of youth when those who came to offer gifts saw them. Then the hunt for the young of the birds and the deer started, and the priests and sacrifices received the spoils of the hunt. And when they found the young of the birds and the deer, they went at once to place the blood of the deer and of the birds in the mouths of the stones that were Tohil and Avilix. As soon as the blood had been drunk by the gods, the stones spoke when the priests and sacrifices came to bring their offerings, and they did the same before their symbols, burning Perikon and Holomokox. The symbols of each one were there where they had been placed on the top of the mountain. But they, the priests, did not live in their houses by day, but walked over the mountains and ate only the young horseflies, the wasps, and the bees that they hunted. They had neither good food nor good drink, and neither were the roads from their homes known, nor did they know where their wives had remained. Part 4 Now many towns being founded one by one, and the different branches of the tribes were being reunited and settled close to the roads that they had opened, as for Balam Quitse, Balamakab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam, it was not known where they were, but when they saw the tribes that passed on the roads, instantly they began to shout on the mountaintops, howling like a coyote, screaming like a mountain cat, and imitating the roaring of the puma and the jaguar. And the tribes, seeing these things as they walked, said, Their screams are like those of the coyote, of the mountain cat, of the puma, and of the jaguar. They want to appear to the tribes as though they are not men and they only do this to deceive us, the people. Their hearts wish for something. Surely they do not frighten us with what they do. They mean something with the roaring of the puma, and with the noise of the jaguar, which they break into when they see one or two men walking. What they want is to make an end of us. Every day the priests came to their houses and to their women, carrying only the young of the bumblebees, the wasps, and the honeybees to give to their women. Every day, too, they came before Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz, and said in their hearts, Here are Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. We can offer them only the blood of the deer and the birds. We take only blood from our ears and our arms. Let us ask Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz for strength and vigor. What will the tribe say about the deaths of the people which, one by one, we are killing? They said to one another as they went into the presence of Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. Then they punctured their ears and their arms before the divinities. They caught their blood and put it in a vase near the stones. They were not really stones, but each one appeared in the likeness of a youth. They were happy with the blood of the priests and sacrifices when they arrived with this example of their work. Follow their tracks, those of the animals that they sacrificed. There is your salvation. From there, from Tulan, whence you brought us, they were told, came the skin called Pazilizib, which was given to you, smeared with blood. Spill your blood, and let this be the offering of Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. Here is how Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam began the abduction of the men of the tribes of Vukamag. Then came the killing of the tribes. They seized a man as he walked alone, or two when they were walking together, and it was not known when they were seized, and then they went to sacrifice them before Tohil and Avelix. Afterwards, they sprinkled the blood on the road and placed the heads separately on the road, and the tribe said, The jaguar ate them. And they spoke thus because, like the footprints of the jaguar, these were the tracks that they had left, although they did not show themselves. Already many of the men had been carried off, but the tribes did not notice it until later. Could it be Tohil and Avilix who have been here among us? They must be the ones who the priests and sacrifices are feeding. Where are their homes? Let us follow their footprints, said all the people. Then they held a council among themselves. Then they began to follow the footprints of the priests and the sacrifices, but they needed to be clearer. There were only tracks of wild animals and tracks of jaguars that they saw. 
but the tracks were not distinct. The first ones were not clear because they were reversed, as though made, so that the people went astray, and their way needed to be clarified. A mist formed, a black rain fell, and made much mud, and it began to drizzle. This was what the people saw before them, and their hearts became weary of searching for and following them on the roads, because the beings of Tohill, Avilix, and Hakovitz were so great that the latter withdrew to the summit of the mountains in the vicinity of the people whom they killed. Thus began the abduction of the people when the sorcerers caught the tribes on the roads and sacrificed them before Tohil, Avilix, and Hakovitz, but they saved their own sons there on the mountain. Tohil, Avilix, and Hakovitz had the appearance of three youths and walked by virtue of the magic stone. There was a river in which they bathed, at the edge of the water, and only there did they appear. For this reason it was called the Bathing Place of Tohil, and this was the name of the river. They frequently appeared to the tribes, but when the people saw them, they vanished immediately. Then they had tidings of where Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam were, and at once the tribes held counsel as to the way in which they could be killed. In the first place, the tribes wanted to discuss the way to overcome Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz, and all the priests and sacrificers of the tribe said to the people, Arise, all of you, call everyone, let there be neither one nor two groups among us who remain behind the others. All assembled, they assembled in great numbers and deliberated among themselves. And they said, asking each other, What shall we do to overcome the quiche of Kavek, by whose hands our sons and vassals are being killed? It is not known how our people are being destroyed. If we must perish because of these abductions, so let it be. And if the power of Tohil, Avilix, and Hakovitz is so great, then let our God be this Tohil, and God grant that you take him captive. It is not possible that they will overcome us. Are there not, perchance, enough men among us? And the Kavik are not many, they said, when all were assembled. And some said, turning to the tribes, when they spoke, Who has seen those who bathe in the river every day? If they are Tohil, Avalix, and Hakavitz, then we shall overcome them first, and afterwards we shall begin the destruction of the priests and sacrifices. This is what many of them said when they talked. But how shall we overcome them? they asked again. This shall be our way of overcoming them, since they have the appearance of youths when they let themselves be seen in the water, then let two maidens who are really beautiful and very lovely go and provoke in their desire to possess them, they said. Very well, let us go then, let us find two beautiful maidens, they exclaimed, and then they went to find their daughters, and truly beautiful were the maidens. Then they instructed the maidens, Go, our daughters, go to wash clothes at the river, and if you see the three youths, undress before them, and if their hearts desire you, call to them. If they say to you, May we come to you, answer yes. And when they ask, Where do you come from? Whose daughters are you? Tell them, We are daughters of the Lord's. Then you shall say, Give us a token of yours, and if after they have given you something they want to kiss your faces, really give yourselves to them, and if you do not give yourselves to them, we shall kill you. Afterward our hearts will be satisfied. When you have the token, bring it here, and this shall be proof, in our judgment, that they were joined with you. Thus spoke the lords when they advised the two maidens. Here are their names, Istar was the name of one of the maidens, and the other was Shpuch. And the two maidens, Ishtar and Shpuch, were sent to the river, to the bathing places of Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavitz. All of the tribes agreed on this. They went at once well adorned, and they were truly very beautiful when they went there, where Tohil was bathing, so that they would be seen when they were washing. When they went, the lords were happy, because they had sent their two daughters. As soon as the latter arrived at the river, they began to wash. 
The two had already taken off their clothes and were bending over the stones when Tohil, Avalix, and Hakovitz came. They came there to the edge of the river and paused a moment, surprised to see the two young girls who were washing, and the girls became ashamed at the moment when Tohil came. But the two girls did not appeal to Tohil, and then he asked them, Where did you come from? Thus he asked the two maidens, and added, What do you want when you come here to the edge of our water? And they answered, The lords have sent us to come here. Go look at the faces of Tohil and speak with them, the lords told us, and then bring proof that you have seen their faces, they told us. Thus the two girls spoke, making known the purpose of their coming. The tribes actually wanted the Tohil incarnation to violate the two maidens. But Tohil, Avilix, and Hakavit said, speaking again to Ixtar and Ixpuch, as the two maidens were called, Very well, with you shall go proof of our conversation. Wait a little, and then you shall give it to the lords, they said. Then they held a council with the priests and sacrificers, and they said to Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iqui Balam, Paint three capes, paint on them the symbol of your being, in order that it may be recognized by the tribes when the maidens who are. Washing, carry them back, give the capes to them. Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta were told. At once the three began to paint. First Balam Kitze painted a jaguar. The figure was made and painted on the surface of the cape. Then Balam Akab painted the figure of an eagle on the surface of a cape. And then Mahukuta painted bumblebees and wasps all over, figures and drawings of which he painted on the cloth. And the three finished their painting, three pieces they painted. Then they went to give the capes to Ekstar and Ekspuch, as they were called, and Balamkitze. Balamakab and Mahukuta said to them, Here is proof of your conversation with us. Take these before the lords. Say to them, in truth, Tohil has talked to us. Here we bring the proof. Tell them, and have them dress themselves in the clothes that you will give them. They told the maidens this when they bade them farewell. The latter went at once, carrying the above-mentioned painted capes. When they arrived, the lords were filled with joy to see their faces and their hands, from which hung the things the maidens had gone for. Did you see the face of Tohil? they asked them. Yes, we saw it, answered Ixtar and Ixpuch. Very well, and you bring the token, do you not? the lords asked, thinking that this was proof of their sin. Then the maidens held out the painted capes, all covered with figures, of jaguars and eagles and covered with bumblebees and wasps, painted on the surface of the cloth which shone before them. At once they felt a desire to put the capes on, the jaguar did nothing when the lord threw the first painting on his back. Then the lord put on the second painting, with the figure of the eagle. The lord felt very well wrapped in it, and he turned around before all of them. Then he undressed before all, and put on the third painted cape, and now he had on himself the bumblebees and wasps that were on it. Instantly the bumblebees and wasps stung his flesh. Not being able to suffer the stings of these insects, he began to scream because of the insects whose figures were painted on the cloth, the painting of Mahukuta, which was the third one that had been painted. Thus they were overcome. Then the lords reprimanded the two maidens named Ixtar and Kispush. What kind of clothes are those that you have brought? Where did you go to bring them, you devils? They said to the maidens when they reprimanded them. Tohil overcame everyone. Well, what the lords wanted was that Tohil should have gone to amuse himself with Ekstar and Ekspuch, and that the maidens would have become whores, for the tribes believed that they would serve to tempt them, but they couldn't overcome them, thanks to those miraculous men, Balam Kidze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam. Afterwards the tribes held council again. What shall we do with them? In truth, their estate is very great, they said when they assembled again in council. Well, then we shall waylay them, we shall kill them, and we shall arm ourselves with bows and shields. Perchance are we few. 
Let there not be one or two among us who remain behind. This is what they said when they held a council, and all the people were armed. Many were the warriors when all the people gathered together for the killing. Meanwhile, there were Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam. They were on the mountain Hakavits, on the hill of this name. They were there in order to save their sons, who were on the mountain. And they did not have many people, they did not have multitudes such as the multitudes of the tribes. The summit of the mountain where they had their place was small, and for that reason, when the tribes assembled together and rose, they decided to kill all of them. In this manner then took place the reunion of all the people, all armored with their bows and their shields. It is impossible to describe the richness of their arms. The appearance of all the chiefs and men was very beautiful, and certainly all obeyed their orders. They shall positively be destroyed, and as for Tohil, he shall be our god. We shall worship him if we take him prisoner, they said to each other. But Tohil knew everything, and so did Balam Kutze, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta. They heard all the plans, because they had not slept or rested since the warriors had armed themselves. Then all the warriors rose up and started out on the road, intending to enter the town by night. However, none of the warriors who were waiting on the road saw them arrive, and Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta then destroyed them. All remained watching along the road, but they heard nothing, and they finally fell asleep. Then Balam Kuitze, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta began to pull out their eyelashes and their beards. They took off the metal ornaments from their throats, their crowns and necklaces. And they took the metal from the handles of their spears. They did this to punish them, humiliate them, and give them an example of the power of the Kishé people. When the warriors awoke, they wanted to take their crowns and their staffs, but they no longer had metal in the staff handles or their crowns. Who has stripped us? Who has torn out our beards? Whence have they come to rob us of our precious metals? said all of the warriors. Can it be these devils who are carrying off the men? But they will not succeed in frightening us. We shall enter their town by force, and we shall again see the face of our silver. This we shall do, said all the tribes, and all truly intended to carry out their word. Meanwhile, the hearts of the priests and the sacrificers on the summit of the mountain were calm. Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam, having talked together, built a wall at the edge of the town and enclosed it with boards and thorns. Then they made figures in the form of men and put them in rows on the wall, armed them with shields and arrows, and adorned them, putting metal crowns on their heads. They put on the simple wooden figures and adorned them with the metal they had taken from the tribes on the road, and with them they decorated the figures. They made a moat around the town, and then they asked for advice from Tohil. Shall they kill us? Shall they overcome us? Their hearts said to Tohil, Do not be troubled, I am here, and this you will use. Do not be afraid, he said to Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam, when they were given the bumblebees and the wasps. This is what they went to fetch. And when they came, they put them inside four big gourds that were placed around the town. They shut the bumblebees and wasps inside the gourds in order to fight the people with them. The city was watched from afar, spied upon, and observed by the scouts of the tribes. They are not many, they said, but they saw only the wooden figures, which lightly moved their bows and their shields. In truth, they had the appearance of men and had the appearance of warriors when the tribes looked at them, and all the tribes were happy because they saw that there were not many. There were many tribes. It was not possible to count the people, the warriors and soldiers who were going to kill Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta, who were on the mountain Hakavits, the name of the place where they were found. Now we shall tell you about their arrival. They were there. Then Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam were all together on the mountain with their wives and their children when all the warriors and soldiers came. 
The tribes did not number 16,000 or 24,000 men, but even more. They surrounded the town, crying out loudly, armed with arrows and shields, beating drums, giving war whoops, whistling, shouting, and inciting them to fight when they arrived in front of the town. But the priests and sacrificers were not frightened. They only looked at them from the edge of the wall, where they were in good order with their wives and children. They thought only of the strength and the shouting of the tribes when they came up the side of the mountain. Shortly before they were about to throw themselves at the entrance of the town, the four gourds that were at the edge of the town were opened, and the bumblebees and the wasps came out of the gourds. Like a great cloud of smoke, they emerged from the gourds. Thus, the warriors perished because of the insects that stung the pupils of their eyes and fastened themselves to their noses, their mouths, their legs, and their arms. Where are they? they said. Those who went to get and bring in all the bumblebees and wasps that are here? The bumblebees and wasps swarmed over each man, buzzing in swarms, and went right for their eyes, leaving the men stunned and unable to hold on to their broken shields and bows. The warriors were lying on the mountainside when they died, and as a result they were no longer able to feel the impact of arrows and axe wounds. Balam Kitse and Balam Akab used only blunt sticks. Their wives also took part in this killing. Only a part of them returned, and all the tribes began to flee. However, they executed the first ones they caught. A number of the men perished, and those who did so were not the men they had intended to kill, but rather those who had fallen victim to the insects. Neither was it a deed of valor, because the warriors were not killed by arrows or by shields. Then all the tribes surrendered. The people humbled themselves before Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta. Have pity on us! Do not kill us! they exclaimed. Very well, although you deserve to die, you shall instead become our vassals for the rest of your lives, they said to them. In this way all of the tribes were destroyed by our first mothers and fathers, and this happened there on the mountain Hakavitz, as it is now called. This was where they first settled, where they multiplied and increased, begot their daughters, and gave being to their sons on the mountain Hakavitz. They were then very happy when they had overcome all the tribes whom they had destroyed on the mountaintop. In this way they carried out the destruction of the tribes, of all the tribes. After this their hearts rested. And they said to their sons that when the tribes intended to kill them, the hour of their own death was approaching, and now we shall tell of the deaths of Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam, as they were called. And as they had had a presentiment of their death, they counseled their children. They were not ill. They had neither pain nor agony when they gave their advice to their children. These are the names of their sons. Balam Kitze had two sons. Kokaib, the first, was called, and Kokavib, the second son of Balam Kitze, the grandfather and father of Kavek. And these are the two sons that Balam Akab begot. Here are their names. Kuakul, the first of his sons, was called, and Koakutek was the name of the second son of Balam Akab, the founder of those of Nihaib. Mahuchuta had but one son, who was called Koahau. Those three had sons, but Ikibalam did not have children. They were really the sacrifices, and these are the names of their sons. So then they bade their sons farewell. The four were together, and they began to sing, feeling sad in their hearts, and their hearts wept when they sang the Kamuku, as the song is called which they sang when they bade farewell to their sons. O oh, our sons, we are going, we are going away. Sane advice and wise counsel, we leave you. And you too, who came from our distant country, O oh, our wives, they said to their women, and they bade farewell to each one. We are going back to our town. There already in his place is our lord of the stags, to be seen there in the sky. We are going to begin our return. We have completed our mission here, and our days have ended. 
Think then of us. Do not erase us from your memory, nor forget us. You shall see your homes and your mountains again. Settle there, and so let it be. Go on your way, and you shall see again the place from which we came. These are the words they said when they bade them farewell. Then Balam Kitze left the symbol of his being. This is a memory for which I leave you. This will be your power. I take my. Leave filled with sorrow, he added. Then he left the symbol of his being, the Pisom Gagal, as it was called, whose form was invisible because it was wrapped up and could not be unwrapped. The seam did not show because it was not seen when they wrapped it up. In this way they took their leave, and immediately they disappeared there on the summit of the mountain Hakavitz. Because they were not visible when they vanished, the four lords' wives and children did not bury them. Only their leaving was seen dearly, and therefore the bundle was very dear to them. It was a reminder of their fathers, and at once they burned incense before this reminder of their fathers. And then the lords, who succeeded Balam Kitse, begot new generations of men, and this was the beginning of the grandfathers and fathers of those of Kavek. But their sons, those called Kokaib and Kokavib, did not disappear. In this way the four died, our first grandfathers and fathers, in this way they disappeared, leaving their children on the mountain Hakavitz, where they have remained. The people were being subdued already, and their grandeur ended. The tribes no longer had power, and all lived to serve daily. They remembered their fathers. Great was the glory of the bundle to them. They never unwrapped it, but it was always wrapped and with them. Bundle of greatness, as they called it when they extolled and named that which their fathers had left in their care as a symbol of their being. In this manner, then, came about the disappearance and end of Balam Kitse, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Iki Balam, the first men who came there from the other side of the sea where the sun rises. They had been here a long time when they died, being very old, the chiefs and sacrifices, as they were called. Then they decided to go to the east, thinking thus to fulfill the command of their fathers, which they had remembered. It had been a long time since their fathers had died when the tribes gave them their wives and thus they acquired many relatives-in-law when the three took wives. And starting on their journey, they said, We are going to the east, where our fathers came. So they said that when the three sons set out. One was called Kokaib, and he was the son of Balam Kitze of the Kavek. The one called Kwakutek was the son of Balam Akab of the Nihaib, and the other called Kwahau was the son of Mahukuta of the Ahau Kishe. These then are the names of those who went there to the other side of the sea. The three went then and were endowed with intelligence and experience, but they were not common men. They took the leave of all their brothers and relatives and left joyfully. We shall not die, we shall return said the three when they left. Certainly they crossed the sea when they came to the east to receive the investiture of the kingdom, and this was the name of the Lord, King of the East, where they went. When they arrived before Lord Naxit, which was the name of the great Lord, the only supreme judge of all the kingdoms, he gave them the insignia of the kingdom and all its distinctive symbols. Then came the insignia of Arpop and Arpop Kamha, and then the insignia of the grandeur and the sovereignty of Arpop and Arpop Kamha, and Naxit ended by giving them the insignia of royalty, which are the canopy, the throne, the flutes of bone, the cham cham, yellow beads, puma claws, jaguar claws, the heads and feet of the deer, dais, snail shells, tobacco, little gourds, parrot feathers, standards of royal aigret feathers, tatum, and caxcon. All the preceding they carried, those who came after going to the other side of the sea to receive the paintings of Tulan, the paintings, as these were called, in which they wrote their histories. Then, having arrived at their town, called Hakavitz, all the people of Tamub and of Ilokab assembled there. 
all the tribes were assembled and were filled with joy when Kokaib, Kwakutek, and Kwahau arrived, and there they again assumed the rule of the tribes. The people of Rabinal, the Kachikel, and the people of Tsikinaha rejoiced. Before them they showed the insignia of the grandeur of the kingdom. Great, too, were the tribes, although they had not finished showing their might. And they were there in Hakavitz. All were there with those who came from the east. There they spent much time. There, on the summit of the mountain, they were in great numbers. There, too, the wives of Balam Kitze, Balam Akab, and Mahukuta died. Later they left, abandoning their country and searching for other places in which to settle. Innumerable were the places in which they settled, where they were, and which they named. There our first mothers and our first fathers were reunited and increased. So said the older adults when they told how they left their first capital, called Hakovitz, and went to find another capital, called Chiquix. They were in this other town for a long time, where they had daughters and sons. There were many of them there and there were four other places, to each of which they gave the name of their town. Their daughters and sons married, they gave them away in marriage, and the presents and favors they received were considered the price for their daughters, and in this way they lived happily. Afterwards they went through each one of the wards of the town, the different names of which are Chikix, Chichak, Humetaha, Kulba, and Kavinal. These were the names of the places where they settled, and they surveyed the hills and their towns, and sought the uninhabited places, for, altogether, they were now very many. Those who had gone to the east to receive sovereignty were now dead. They were already old when they arrived at each of the towns. They did not become accustomed to the different places through which they passed. They suffered many hardships and troubles, and only after a long time did the Grand Faithers and Faithers arrive in their town. Here is the name of the city to which they came. Finally, Kokeb returned and gave an account of his mission. He brought the titles of Apop, Atzalam, Tzanchinamital, and many others. He showed the insignia that must accompany these titles, and they were the claws of the jaguars and eagles, the skins of other animals, and also stones, sticks, etc. Seeing his wife with a newly born child in her arms, he asked whence it had come. It is of thy blood, answered the woman, of thy flesh and thy same bones. Kokeb accepted the explanation and taking the child's cradle said, From today on and forever, this child shall be called Balam Konache. And the latter began the house of Konache and Istayul. With respect to the second journey of the Kishé princes, the Titulu says that they returned satisfied to Hakavitz Chipal and displayed the signs and symbols that they brought. Chizmachi is the name of the site of their town, where they were afterwards and where they settled. There, under the fourth generation of kings, they developed their power and constructed buildings of mortar and stone. And Konache and Beleheb Kwe, the Galelahau, ruled. Then King Kotuha and Iztayul reigned, as they were called the Apop and the Apop Kamha, who reigned there in Izmachi, which was the beautiful city that they had built. Only three great houses were there in Izmachi. There were not twenty-four great houses then, only their three great houses, only a great house of the Kavek, only a great house of the Nihaib, and only one of the people of Ahaukishé. Only two had great houses, the two branches of the family, the Kishé and the Tamub. And there they were in Izmak with only one thought, without disputes or difficulties, peaceful was the kingdom. They had no disputes, and in their hearts were only peace and happiness. They were neither envious nor jealous. Their grandeur was limited. They had not thought of aggrandizing themselves or of expanding. When they tried to do it, they fastened the shield there in Ismak, but only to give a sign of their empire, as a symbol of their power and a symbol of their greatness. Seeing this, the people of Ilokab began the war, 
They wanted to kill King Kotuha, wishing to have a chief of their own, and as for Lord Istayul, they wanted to punish him, that he be punished and killed by those of Ilokab. But their evil plans against King Kotuha did not succeed, for he fell upon them before the people of Ilokab were able to kill him. This then was the beginning of the revolution and the dissensions of the war. First they attacked the town, and the warriors came. And what they wanted was to ruin the Quiche race. They wanted to reign alone, but they only came to die. They were captured and fell into captivity, and few among them succeeded in escaping. Immediately afterwards, the sacrifices began. The people of Ilokab were sacrificed before God, and this was the punishment for their sins by order of King Kotuha. Many also fell into slavery and servitude. They only went to give themselves up to be overcome because they had arranged the war against the lords and against the town. The destruction and ruin of the Quiche race and their king was what they wished for, but they did not succeed in accomplishing it. In this way, the sacrifice of men began before the gods, when the War of the Shields broke out, which was the reason that they began the fortifications of the city of Ismak. Their power originated there because the empire of the king of the Quiche was really large. They were, in every sense, marvellous kings. No one could dominate them, and neither was there anyone who could humble them and at the same time they were the builders of the grandeur of the kingdom that they had founded there in Ismak. There the fear of God waxed, they were inspired with awe, and the tribes large and small were filled with fear, for they saw the arrival of the captives, those who were sacrificed and killed because of the power and sovereignty of King Kotuha, the King Istayul, and the people of Nihaib and Ahokishe. There were only three branches of the Quiche family there in Ismachi, as the town was called, and there they also began the feasts and orgies for their daughters when suitors came to ask for them in marriage. There the so-called three great houses gathered, and there they drank their drinks. They also ate their food, which was the price of their sisters and the price of their daughters, and their hearts were joyful when they did it. They ate and drank in the great houses. In this way we show our gratitude, and thus we open the road for our posterity and our descendants. This is the demonstration of our consent to their becoming husbands and wives, they said. There they identified themselves, and there they took their names. They distributed themselves in clans in the seven principal tribes and in cantons. Let us unite, we of the Kavek, we of the Nihaib, and we of the Ahau Kishe, said the three clans and the three great houses. For a long time they were there in Ismachi until they found and saw another town, and abandoned that of Ismachi. After they left there, they came here to the town of Gumarka, as the Kishe named it, when kings Kotuha and Guchumats and all the lords came. There had then begun the fifth generation of men since the beginning of civilization and of the population, the beginning of the existence of the nation. There then they built many houses, and at the same time constructed the temple of God in the center of the high part of the town. They located it when they arrived and settled there. Then their empire grew. They were very numerous when they held their council in their great houses. They reunited, but later divided because dissensions had arisen and jealousies grew up amongst them over the price for their sisters and their daughters, and because they no longer drank together. This then was the reason why they divided and why they turned against each other, and they threw the skulls of the dead. They hurled them around among each other. Then they divided into nine families, and having ended the dispute over the sisters and the daughters, they carried out the plan of dividing the kingdom into twenty-four great houses, as they did. It has been a long time since they came here to their town and finished the twenty-four great houses in the city of Gumarka, which were blessed by the bishop. Later the city was abandoned. There they increased. There 
they installed their splendid thrones and royal seats and distributed their honors among all the lords. The nine lords of Kavek formed nine families. The lords of Nihaib formed another nine, the lords of Ahauki She formed another four, and the lords of Zakwik formed another two families. They became very numerous, and many also followed each of the lords. These were the first among their vassals, and each of the lords had a large family. We shall now tell the names of the lords of each of the great houses. Here, then, are the names of the lords of Kavek. The first of the lords was Apop, then Apop Kamha, Artohil, Agukumats, Nimchoko Kavek, Popolvinak Chitui, Lolmet Kwenei, Popolvinak Pahomtsalats, and Uchuk Kamha. These then were the lords of Kavek, nine lords, each one of whom had his own great house, which afterwards will appear again. Here then are the lords of Nihaib. The first was Ahau Galil, then Ahau Atzik Vinak, Galel Kamha, Nima Kamha, Uchuch Kamha, Nim Choko Nihaibab, Avilix, Yakolatam, Utsam Pop Zalklatol, and Nima Lolmet Wikoltax, the nine lords of Nihaib. And as for those of Ahau Kishe, these are the names of the lords Atzik Vinak, Ahau Lolmet, Ahau Nim Choko, Ahau and Ahau Hakavitz, the four lords of Ahau Kishé, in the order of their great houses. And the house of Zakwich had two families, the lords Tzutuha and Galel Zakwich. These two lords had only one great house. In this way, the number of the twenty-four lords was completed, and the twenty-four great houses came into being. Thus, the grandeur and power of the sons of the Quiche grew when they built the town of the ravines out of stone and mortar. Then the small tribes and the great tribes came before the king. The Quiche increased when their glory and majesty waxed, when they raised the house of their gods and the house of their lords. But it was not they who worked, constructed their houses, or made the house of the gods, for they were made by their sons and vassals, who had multiplied. And they were not cheating them, nor robbing them, nor seizing them by force, because, in reality, each belonged to the lords, and many of their brothers and relatives had come together and had assembled to hear the commands of each of the lords. The lords were really loved, and great was their glory, and the sons and the vassals held the birthdays of the lords in great respect when the inhabitants of the country and the city multiplied. But it did not happen that all the tribes delivered themselves up, and neither did the country and towns of the inhabitants fall in battle. They increased because of the marvels of the lords, King Gukumats and King Kotuha. Gukumats was truly a marvellous king. For seven days he mounted to the skies, and for seven days he went down into Shibalba. Seven days he changed himself into a snake and really became a serpent. For seven days he changed himself into an eagle. For seven days he became a jaguar. And his appearance was really that of an eagle and a jaguar. For another seven days he changed himself into clotted blood and was only motionless blood. The nature of this king was really marvellous, and all the other lords were filled with terror before him. Tidings of the wonderful nature of the king were spread, and all the lords of the towns heard them, and this was the beginning of the grandeur of the Quiche, when King Gukumats gave these signs of his power. His sons and his grandsons never forgot him. He did not do this in order to be an extraordinary king. He did it as a means of dominating all the towns, as a means of showing that only one was called upon to be chief of the people. The generation of the wonderful king called Gukumats was the fourth generation, and Gukumats was also the Apop and the Apop Kamha. They left successors and descendants who reigned and ruled, bore children and did many other things. Tepepul and Istayul, whose reign was the fifth generation of kings, were begotten, and in the same way each of the generations of these lords had succession. Here are the names of the sixth generation of kings. There were two great kings, 
The first was called Gagquikab, and the other Kavizima, and they performed heroic deeds and aggrandized the Quiche, for surely they were of marvelous nature. Here is the destruction and division of the fields and the towns of the neighboring nations, small and large. Among them was that which, in olden times, was the country of the Kachikel, the present Shuvila, and the country of the people of Rabinal, Pamasha, the country of the people of Kaoke, Zakabaha, and the towns of the peoples of Zakuleu, of Chuvimikina, Zelahu, Chuvatzak, and Soloche. These people hated Kikab. He made war on them, and certainly conquered and destroyed the fields and towns of the people of Rabinal, the Kachikel, and the people of Zakulu. He came and conquered all the towns, and the soldiers of Quikab carried his arms to distant parts. One or two tribes did not bring tribute, and then he fell upon all the towns, forcing them to bring tribute to Quikab and Kavizima. They were enslaved, they were wounded, and they were killed with arrows against the trees to which they had been tied, and for them there was no longer any glory, they no longer had power. In this way, came about the destruction of the towns, which were instantly razed to the ground. Like a flash of lightning that struck and shattered the rock, in an instant the conquered people were filled with terror. Before Colche, as a symbol of a town destroyed by him, there is now a pile of stones which look almost as if they had been cut with the edge of an axe. It is there on the coast, called Patatayub, and it may be clearly seen today by people who pass as proof of the value of Kikab. They could neither kill him nor overcome him, for, in truth, he was a brave man, and all the people rendered tribute to him. And all the lords, having gathered in council, went to fortify the ravines and the towns, having conquered the towns of all the tribes. Then spies went out to observe the enemy, and they found something like towns in the occupied places, just in case, by chance, the tribes might return to occupy the town, they said when they reassembled in council. Then they went out to take up their positions. These shall be like our forts and our town, our walls and defenses. Here shall our valor and our manhood be proved, said all the lords when they went to take up the position assigned to each clan in order to fight the enemy. Having received their orders, they went to the places that had been founded in the land of the tribes. Go there, for now it is our land. Do not be afraid. If there are still enemies who come to kill you, come quickly and let me know and I will go to kill them, said Quikab, when he took leave of all of them in the presence of the Galil and the Atzik Vinak. Then the archers and the slingers, as they were called, set out. Then the grandfathers and fathers of the entire Quiche nation took their battle positions. They were on each one of the mountains, and they were like guards of the mountains. They were guarding with their bows and slings. They were the sentinels of the war. They were not of different origins, nor did they have a different god when they went. They went only to fortify their towns, then all the people of Uvila went out, those of Chulimal, Zakwia, Zahbakwe, Chitema, Vaksalahu, and the people of Kabrakan, Chabikat Chihunapu, and those of Makar, those of Zoyaba, and those of Zakabaha, those of Ziaha, those of Mikina, those of Zelahu, and those of the coast. They went to observe the war and to guard the land when they went by order of Quikab and Kavizima who were the Apop and the Apop Kamha, and the Galil and the Atzik Vinak, who were the four lords. They were sent in order to watch the enemies of Quikab and Kavizima, the names of the kings, both of the house of Kavek, of Quima, the name of the lord of the people of Nihaib, and of Achak Eboi, the name of the lord of the people of Ahaukishe. These were the names of the lords who sent them, when their sons and vassals went to the mountains, to each one of the mountains, they went at once and they took captives. They brought their prisoners into the presence of Kikab, Kavizima, the Galil, and the Atzik Vinak. The archers and slingers made war, taking captives and prisoners.
Some of the defenders of the positions were heroes, and that lords gave them gifts and lavished rewards upon them when they came to deliver all their captives and prisoners. Later they gathered in council by order of the lords, the Apop, the Apop Kamha, the Galil, and the Atsik Vinak, and they decided and said that those who were there first should have the rank of representing their families. I am the Apop, I am the Apop Kamha, mine shall be the rank of the Apop, meanwhile thou the Ahau Galel shall have the rank of Galel, said all the lords when they held a council. Those of Tamub and of Ilokab did likewise, equal in position with the three clans of the Quiche, when for the first time they named their sons and vassals captains and ennobled them. This was the result of the council. But they were not made captains here in Quiche. The mountain where the sons and vassals were made captains for the first time has its own name. When all were sent, each one went to his mountain, and all were reunited. Zebalax and Zekamax are the names of the mountains where they were made captains and received their commands. This happened in Chulimal. In this manner was the naming, promotion, and distinction of the twenty Galel and the twenty Arpop, who were named by the Arpop and the Arpop Kamha, and by the Galel and the Atzik Vinak. All of the Galel Arpops received their rank, eleven Nimchoko, Galel Ahau, Galel Zakwich, Galel Achi, Rapop Achi, Ratsalam Achi, and Utsam Achi were the names that the warriors received when their titles and distinctions were conferred upon them, as they were on their thrones and on their seats, being the first sons and vassals of the Quiche nation, their spees, their scoots, the archers, the slingers, the walls, doors, forts, and bastions of the Quiche. Those of Tamub and Ilokab also did thus. They named and ennobled the first sons and vassals who were in each place. This, then, was the origin of the Galel Ahpops and of the titles that are now preserved in each one of these places. This is the way their titles were created, by the Ahpop and the Ahpop Kamha, by the Galel and the Atzik Vinak. We shall now tell of the house of God. The house was also given the same name as the God. The great edifice of Tohil was the name of the Temple of Tohil, one of those of Kavek. Avelix was the name of the Temple of Avelix of the people of Nihaib, and Hakavitz was the name of the Temple of the God of the people of Ahaukishe. Tsutuha, which is seen in Kabaha, is the name of a large edifice in which there was a stone that all the lords of Quiche worshipped, and that was also worshipped by all the tribes. The people first offered their sacrifices before Tohil, and afterwards went to pay their respects to the Arpop and the Arpop Kamha. Then they went to present their gorgeous feathers and their tribute before the king. The kings whom they maintained were the Apop and the Apop Kamha, who had conquered their towns. Great lords and wonderful men were the marvelous kings Guchumats and Kotuha, and the marvelous kings Quikab and Kavizima. They knew if there would be war, and everything was clear before their eyes. They saw if there would be death and hunger, and if there would be strife. They knew that there was a place where it could be seen, and that there was a book which they called the Popol Vu. Not only was the estate of the lords great in this way, but their fasts were also great, and this was in recognition of their having been created, and in recognition of their having been given their kingdoms. They fasted for a long time and made sacrifices to their gods. Here is how they fasted. Nine men fasted, and another nine made sacrifices and burned incense. Thirteen more men fasted, and another thirteen more made offerings and burned incense before Tohil. And before their god, they nourished themselves only with fruits, with zapotes, matasanos, and jocotes, and they did not eat any tortillas. Now, if seventeen men made sacrifices or ten fasted, the truth is, they did not eat. They fulfilled their great precepts and thus showed their position as lords. Neither had they women to sleep with, but they remained alone, fasting. They were in the house of God. All day they prayed, 
burning incense and making sacrifices. Thus they remained from dusk until dawn, grieving in their hearts and in their breasts, begging for happiness and life for their sons and vassals, as well as for their kingdom, and raising their faces to the sky. Here are their petitions to their God when they prayed, and this was the supplication of their hearts. O thou the beauty of the day, thou Hurakan, thou heart of heaven and of earth, thou, giver of richness and giver of the daughters and the sons, turn towards us your power and your riches, grant life and growth unto my sons and vassals, let those who must maintain and nourish thee multiply and increase, those who invoke thee on the roads, in the fields, on the banks of the rivers, in the ravines, under the trees, under the vines. Give them daughters and sons, let them not meet disgrace nor misfortune, let not the deceiver come behind or before them, let them not stumble, hurt, fornicate, or face justice's judgment, let them not fall on the descent or on the ascent of the road, let them not encounter obstacles in front of them or before them, nor anything that strikes them. Grant them good, beautiful, level roads. Let them not have misfortune nor disgrace through thy fault, through thy sorceries. Grant a good life to those who must give thee sustenance and place food in thy mouth, in thy presence to thee, heart of heaven, heart of earth, bundle of majesty, and thou, Tohil, thou, Avilix, thou, Hakavits, arch of the sky, surface of the earth, the four corners, the four cardinal points, let there be but peace and tranquilly in thy mouth, in thy presence, O God. Thus spoke the lords, while within, the nine men fasted, the thirteen men, and the seventeen men. During the day they fasted, and their hearts grieved for their sons and vassals, and for all their wives and their children when each of the lords made his offering. This was the price of a happy life, the price of power, the price of the authority of the Apop, of the Apop Kamha, of the Galil, and of the Atsik Vinak, Two by two they ruled, each pair succeeding the other in order to bear the burden of the people of the Quiche nation. One only was the origin of their tradition, and one only was the origin of the manner of maintaining and sustaining, and one only too was the origin of the tradition and the customs of those of Tamub and Ilokab, the people of Rabinal and the Kachikel, those of Sikinaha, Tuhalaha and Uchabaha. And there was but one trunk, a single family, when they heard there in Quiche what all of them were to do. But it was not only thus that they reigned. They did not squander the gifts of those whom they sustained and nourished, but they ate and drank them. Neither did they buy them. They had won and seized their empire, their power, and their sovereignty, and it was not at a small cost that they conquered the fields and the towns. The small towns and the large towns paid high ransoms. They brought precious stones and metals. They brought honey of the bees, bracelets of emeralds and other stones, and they brought garlands made of blue feathers, the tribute of all the towns. They came into the presence of the marvellous kings Gukchumats and Kotuha, and before Quikab and Kavizima, the Apop, the Apop Kamha, the Galil, and the Atsik Vinak. What they did was not little, neither were the few tribes that they conquered. Many branches of the tribes came to pay tribute to the Quiche. Full of sorrow, they came to give it over. Nevertheless, the Quiche power did not grow quickly. Guchumats was the one who began the aggrandizement of the kingdom. This was the beginning of his aggrandizement, and that of the Quiche nation. And now we shall name the generations of the lords, and give their names. Again we shall name all of the lords. Here then are the generations and the order of all the rulers, which began with our first grandfathers and our first fathers. Balam Kidze, Balam Akab, Mahukuta, and Ikibalam, when the sun appeared and the moon and the stars were seen. Now then, we shall give the beginning of the generations, the order of kingdoms, from the beginning of their lineage, how the lords entered into power, from their accessions to their deaths. 
We shall give each generation of lords and ancestors, as well as the lord of the town, all and each of the lords. Here, then, the person of each one of the lords of the Quiche shall be shown. Balam Kitse is the root of Kavek. Kokavib is the second generation of the Balam Kitse line. Balam Konashe, with whom the title of Apop began, was the third generation. Kotuha and Istayub, fourth generation. Guchumats and Kotuha too were the first of the marvelous kings of the fifth generation. Tepepul and Istayul of the sixth order. Kikab and Kavizima of the seventh order of succession to the kingdom. Tepepul and Istayub, eighth generation. Tekum and Tepepul, ninth generation. Faksaki Kam and Kwaikab are tenth generation kings. Vukubno and Kutapech, eleventh order of kings. Oxib Kwe and Beleheb Tzi are the twelfth generation of kings. These were the people who were in power when Donadi arrived, and who the Spaniards hanged. Tekum and Tepepul, who paid tribute to the Spaniards, left sons, and the former were the thirteenth generation of kings. Don Juan de Rojas and Don Juan Cortes, the fourteenth generation of kings, were the sons of Tecum and Tepepul. These are then the generations and the order of the kingdom of the lords Arpop and Arpop Kamha of the Quiche of Kavek. And now we shall name the families again. These are the great houses of each of the lords who followed the Arpop and the Arpop Kamha. These are the names of the nine families of those of Kavek, of the nine great houses, and these are the titles of the lords of each one of the great houses, Ahau Apop, one great house. Kuha was the name of this great house, Ahau Apop Kamha, whose great house was called Tzikinaha, Nimchokokavek, one great house Ahau Atohil, one great house Ahau Agukumats, one great house. Popolvinak Chitui, one great house Lolmet Kwene, one great house. Popolvinak Pahom Tsalats Eskuksiba, one great house. Tepeuyaki, one great house. These, then, are the nine families of Kavek, and very numerous were the sons and vassals of the tribes that followed these nine great houses. Here are the nine great houses of Nihaib, but first we shall give the lineage of the rulers of the kingdom. From one root, only these names originated when the sun began to shine with the beginning of light. Balamakab, first grandfather and father Koakul and Koakutek, second generation. Kochahu and Kotsibaha, third generation. Belehebkwe, fourth generation. Kotuha is fifth generation of kings. Batsa, sixth generation. Istayul, the seventh generation of kings. Kotuha II is the eighth order of the kingdom. Beleheb Kwe II, ninth order. Kwema, so called tenth generation. Ahau Kotuha, eleventh generation. Don Cristoval, so called, ruled in the time of the Spaniards. Don Pedro de Robles, the present Ahau Galel. These, then, are all the kings who descended from the Ahau Galel. Now we shall name the lords of each of the great houses. Ahau Galel, the first lord of the Nihaib, was the head of one great house. Ahau Achtzik Vinak, one great house. Ahau Galel Kamha, one great house. Nima Kamha, one great house. Uchuch Kamha, one great house. Nimchoko Nihaib, one great house. Ahau Avilix, one great house. Yakolatum, one great house. Nima Lolmet Yekoltux, one great house. These then are the great houses of the Nihaib. These were the names of the nine families of those of the Nihaib, as they were called. Numerous were the families of each one of the lords whose names we have given first. Here now is the lineage of those of Ahau Kishé, who was their grandfather and father. Mahukuta, the first man. Koahau is the name of the second generation of kings. Kaglakan, Kokazom, Komakun, Vukuba, Kokamel, Koyabako, Vinakbam. These were the kings of those of the Ahau Kishé. This is the order of their generations. Here now are the tides of the lords who made up the great houses. There were only four great houses. Atsik Vinakahau is the title of the first lord of one great house. 
Lol Met Ahau, second lord, a great house. Nim Choko Ahau, third lord, a great house. Hakavitz, fourth lord, a great house. Therefore, four were the great houses of the Ahau Kishe. There were then three Nim Choko, who were like fathers vested with the authority of all the lords of the Kishe. The three Chocos came together in order to make known the orders of the mothers and the orders of the fathers. Great was the position of the three Choco. There were then the Nim Choco of those of Kavek, the Nim Choco of those of Nihaib, who was second, and the Nim Choco Ahau of the Ahau Kishe, who was third. Each one of the three Chocos represented his family. This was the life of the Quiche, because it can no longer be seen in the book of the Popol Vuh, which the kings had in olden times, for it has disappeared. In this manner, then, all the people of the Quiche, which is called Santa Cruz, came to an end.